Greetings of the day to you all. I welcome you all to the day four of this online workshop titled Supernova and Neutrinos. To begin with the first session, we have with us Professor Vivek Dattar, and the topic is Nucleosynthesis of Elements Beyond Carbon and Up to Iron in Next Generation Stars. Production of Still Heavier Elements from Iron to Uranium. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of the organizers. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so let me continue where I left off the last time. Uh, so I have permission, I hope, to share. Uh, yeah, I'm just... Yeah. And uh, shift F5, does it? No. Shift F5 doesn't do it. It's a slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Uh, can you hear me and can you see the slides, please? Yes, sir. We are okay. here. We can see your slides clearly. Okay. So thank you. So uh, let me start where uh, I left off yesterday. Uh, we looked at the uh, neutrinos from the sun. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so this is where we stopped. So I'll continue with this and then go to the material that I had uh, earlier planned uh, for lecture three, but that is anyway historic. So, uh, I think we have. Uh, I have not probably organized myself too well in this. So anyway, so I'll uh, in this, uh, I'll start out by talking about how you measure some of the nuclear properties and reactions of astrophysical interests. Now, of course, when you do that, you require to have tools for that, both theoretical and experimental. And the experimental tools consist of, of course, accelerators, uh, because you want to actually produce these nuclei, which you want to study, you want to make reactions, uh, you want to measure their masses and uh, half-lives and cross-sections and so forth. So you require accelerators. Then, of course, you require detectors because you can make the reaction or you can produce the nucleus, but then you have to study it using detectors. And they are of various kinds and so on. I will, of course, not uh, dwell too much on this, but just point out that these are needed. And then, of course, you want to interpret all of this uh, using uh, theoretical methods, both for reactions and also extracting the quantities of interest. Okay, so first of all, you would like to know uh, some basic properties of the nucleus. First of all, whether they exist at all, these nuclei, because uh, uh, as later I will show you, uh, there is a, uh, you know, we know about uh, 3000 uh, nuclei uh, over the years, but about 8000 are expected to exist. And in fact, many of them are probably there in the processes that go on in supernova and we just haven't uh, found them in, in the laboratory. We haven't uh, produced them, maybe we haven't measured them. So this is the basic thing that we would like to do. We would first like to see if they exist. Then we would like to find out their binding energy. So the, basically the mass, uh, their half-lives, the decay channels. Uh, for instance, if you have a beta decay, then it can beta decay to various states in the daughter nucleus. Uh, and we would like to know those branching ratios. And if there are cascades, we would like to follow those cascades as well. Uh, many of these unstable nuclei are produced in accelerators, uh, where you have hundreds of MEVs or GEV per nucleon beams. And these are in Germany, Japan, France, uh, US, and so on. Of course, new ones are also come, have come up in China, and uh, they will come up in Korea as well. Uh, what you need mostly, as far as the cross-sections go, is you need reaction cross-section for the charged particles with the protons, deutrons, helium-3 and helium-4. Uh, and uh, in, for heavier stars, for the, uh, you need also reactions with heavier nuclei, like carbon-12, uh, oxygen-16 and so on. Uh, so these are needed when you want to do nuclear, uh, nucleosynthesis calculations. Of course, that energy is relevant to stellar core temperatures. Uh, if you remember the uh, uh, temperature in the sun, uh, that's about 15 million degrees in the core of the sun. That corresponds to about 1.3 keV. Okay, So the mean energy of protons in the core is only about 1.3 keV. And if you just calculate the Coulomb barrier for P plus P, that turns out to be uh, about an MeV also. So these are way below the Coulomb barrier. And of course, tunneling, uh, the quantum mechanical tunneling process is involved in these. But in any case, you require to uh, either measure them or if you can't measure them, 
as happens, for instance, for the very first reaction, P plus P going to D plus E plus plus uh, new E, uh, that, that, of course, you can't measure because it's in all, uh, as of now, it is uh, immeasurably small. So then you have to calculate it. Uh, I, have, I have a question, yeah. Professor Dutta. Amol here. Amol here, I have a question. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So, so, so you said that uh, about 8,000 nuclei are, are expected to exist. Yes, uh, yes. Now, what is what is your definition of uh, nuclear uh, existence? Exist, exist, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, when I say 8,000 nuclei are expected to exist, it means that they have the last uh, uh, particle, neutron or proton, uh, which has a binding energy which is positive, uh, which is, that means not particle unbound. If it becomes particle unbound, then of course it decays extremely quickly. Uh, I mean, uh, if it is just barely unbound, of course, and it faces a barrier, then it would decay on the time scales of uh, uh, picosecond to uh, uh, you know 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 20 seconds. Uh, if it is a neutron, then of course it doesn't face a barrier if it is S wave. So uh, if it has to be kind of stable at least for a short time, it has to have an L barrier. It means it has to have angular momentum at least one. So, any case, so these are particle, these are nuclei which do not decay on extremely short time scales because uh, their uh, last particle neutron, the least unbound, uh, uh, the least bound, sorry, least bound particle uh, is, uh, you know, not a positive energy. Okay? That, that's the definition. So, they are all particle bound nuclei. And they are expected to be, of course, it depends on what kind of uh, nuclear uh, model you have. Uh, because these models nowadays are fairly sophisticated. They get things correct to about a few hundred keV uh, as far as the binding energy goes. Uh, they are uh, liquid drop plus some shell correction. And uh, they, but still they differ in the details. And so somebody might predict 7,500, somebody might uh, uh, predict 8,500. That's the range. And we have, uh, you know, just identified only 3,000 3, nuclei. That's not to say we know all about those 3,000 nuclei. Many, many of them, probably about in the region of uh, uh, 1,000 or even more, we just know the ground state. We don't even know their excited state. Some, some of them, we don't even know the spin parity. Some of them, we don't even know the lifetime. So there's a lot, lot of work to be done. And these facilities which are coming up or which are uh, in existence already, they will throw light on this. Okay, so the last uh, I mean, uh, bullet in this is that of course, we need to measure things at uh, energies relevant to stars. And these can be done with either stable targets um, or stable beams. And they could be either radioactive beams or they could be radioactive targets. Uh, Complementary. Okay. Now, when you go down to these low energies, these reaction cross sections drop because of the Coulomb barrier, because tunneling is involved. And uh, this tunneling probability goes down exponentially as you lower the energy. Uh, I will show you in the next, maybe, I, I don't remember which slide number it is, it will come. So, um, you, you cannot use unstable beams and hope to measure things at the energies relevant to stars. So, you have to extrapolate. Uh, so, what is done is, uh, you can, on the other hand, because unstable beam comes with very low intensities, then you can do indirect measurements. So, you do actually transfer or uh, uh, Coulomb breakup measurements, and then they, using theory, are extrapolated to the gamma energy that you require. I'll, I'll tell you what the gamma energy is uh, shortly. Uh, of course, in this process, sometimes you might miss resonances, which might enhance this cross-section manifold. So uh, the advantage of using these indirect measurements is, of course, that the cross-sections are higher because they involve the strong interaction. And they can be tens of millibands, but they also involve nuclear structure information. So that goes in. And uh, uh, so reaction models also go in. So at best, you can get about 10% accuracy in the best of cases. In the worst of cases, it could be much higher. Uh, the error could be much higher. But at least if there is no hope of doing things at the gamma energy, then this is the best that you can do at the present time. Uh, radiative capture cross sections can be inferred from the, so the inverse process, which means the Coulomb dissociation measurements. So just as you can have a capture of a uh, projectile by a target producing a photon, a gamma ray, and uh, the daughter, uh, the product, uh, you can do the reverse by using not real photons, but virtual photons. So 
uh, this involves taking an un, usually an unstable beam because that's where you want to do, make this indirect measurement um, and shooting it on a uh, target which is uh, very heavy like lead 208 it has a large uh, charge on it and so there are virtual photons which you can use and then they actually break up the uh, or they cause uh, dissociation through the coulomb interaction and this kind of process was actually first uh, uh, talked about by fermi and uh, uh, long time and also by williams so it's called the fermi williams method so you can actually they, they actually calculated the virtual photon spectrum in terms of uh, energy of that virtual photon and then uh, folded it with a cross section and uh, at very high energies in fact this uh, uh, coulomb dissociation process is very strong and uh, it becomes really important when you uh, you have a, a high z uh, beam uh, traveling in a, uh, in a uh, kind of storage ring so if you have poor vacuum there you can dissociate that beam rather rapidly so you require really very good vacuum and so on so it, it has consequences but this can also be used usefully uh, in a process like this for instance you actually suppose you want to measure just an example seven beryllium uh, proton radiative capture giving you eight boron then you can shoot eight boron on lead to it which is a source of virtual protons and then look at the breakup seven beryllium proton uh, in in the final state uh, using a spectrometer okay and then uh, you also get the angular distribution of the beryllium seven proton system so you can uh, work back what was the photon uh, what is the multipolarity of that photon because that becomes an issue uh, so it's, it's not exactly the same as this forward process but there are ways uh, in which you can uh, get some information on the process that you really need. Okay, so this is the nuclear landscape, which I talked about. So, uh, in, uh, for instance, Amol asked this question, what do you mean, how many uh, nuclei are there? So, this is the so-called neutron drip line. By the neutron drip line is meant that beyond this, so suppose you take any Z, if you go beyond this, then the neutron binding energy uh, goes negative, or it means that the neutron is unbound. And once it is particle unbound, it very quickly uh, decays. So quickly that it's just uh, very hard to study it in fact. So this is uh, what is what I meant by the, uh, you know, 8,000 nuclei. Uh, on the proton side, it doesn't go really very far because uh, from the stable configuration, uh, as you can see, these are the red, and most of them actually we have found. But uh, on the neutron side, on the neutron rich side, because it's also harder to produce them, you can take a heavy nucleus and then it can fission, and that's what gives rise to many of these nuclei, or you can fragment it, you can produce a little few more nuclei. But unless you have uh, you know, a very neutron rich projectile to start with, hitting a very neutron rich tar stable target, perhaps uh, you can't produce many of these nuclei. So this is actually an experimental challenge to get to these places. Now, most of this, neutron rich region is actually quite uh, um, populated in uh, uh, neutron capture situations in uh, supernovae and in neutron stars. However, there are gaps and that is what these radioactive ion beam uh, experiments would do. So as you can see on the neutron rich side, you have beta minus decay and on the uh, proton rich side, you have beta plus decay. Of course, uh, you also have electron capture decay whenever there is beta plus decay. Uh, on the very heavy side, you have spontaneous fission. So these green uh, squares, you have spontaneous uh, fission. On the proton rich side, again on the heavy side, but also some parts of the rare earth. And now that we are making some of these very proton rich nuclei, uh, you also have uh, alpha decay. And indeed, this is not shown here, but there are also some cases of proton decay that have been seen, spontaneous proton decay. Uh, as far as I know, there is no spontaneous neutron decay that has been observed yet. Uh, there have been cases of spontaneous proton decay and also, I think, spontaneous tri uh, triton decay. Okay, so this is the nuclear landscape. Uh, and uh, as I said, you need accelerators to uh, get there to produce the beams. Uh, and uh, at low energies, the cascade generator or the uh, single ended uh, Van de Graaff accelerator is the one which is most used. At somewhat higher energies, you use a so called tandem Van de Graaff accelerator, where you have a, uh, you know, you produce a negative ion upstairs, it comes down, uh, gets accelerated, gets stripped of electrons, and then comes down. Uh, an example of this is, for instance, the uh, 14 MB tandem accelerator in uh, TIFR, but also in uh, IUAC Delhi. Uh, these cascade generators were the workhorses in the olden days. 
and in fact they were even used it in the 80s and the 90s in underground experiments uh, uh, okay so this is a this is the example of the tandem accelerator at the ifr uh, these are other examples of accelerators the cyclotron for instance which was invented by lorenz and uh, it's, uh, it's very compact because it uses the magnetic field and the rf voltage so the particles get accelerated in the gap by the rf and if they are in sync with the rf then they just keep bending round and round because the cyclotron frequency is independent of the energy it's qb by m as we saw yesterday in the in the case of the iron trap but the principle is the same and it works up to about a gv or so for protons uh then there is the synchrotron for relativistic particles you have a single ring you have an rf uh, gap where you accelerate or you might have multiple gaps and then the energy keeps increasing and then once it has reached the maximum then you can in fact even use it as a storage ring then you keep the magnetic field constant otherwise the magnetic field has to increase in sync with the uh, increasing energy of the beam uh, 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 uh typical machine like that would be for instance uh, the lhc at uh, uh, i should say typical the culmination of the great uh, efforts uh, in building the biggest machine uh, is the lhc but there of course it is also a collider so you accelerate in uh, uh, counter clockwise and clockwise and then you make these beams collide uh, beams of protons of uh, 7 pev each okay. then you have detectors as i said uh, that they are the eyes of the experimenter so you have various kinds of detectors and i think i will not go into details of these but as you can see there are gas uh, detectors there are liquid detectors uh, and then there are solid state detectors there are uh, semiconductor detectors silicon high purity germanium and now even thin diamond detectors are used where you have uh, possibilities of radiation damage uh, scintillation detector sodium iodide was the oldest scintillator discovered by hofstadter in the 50s early 50s uh, who hofstadter is the same person who did the electron scattering experiments on nuclear and then you have many inorganic scintillators such as barium fluoride lanthanum bromide each with their characteristic uh, advantages and disadvantages these are cheap plastic scintillators then you have liquid scintillator detectors which are, uh, also sometimes have the possibility of uh, identifying what particle came and produced the light in that uh, whether it was a photon uh, which caused the electron recoil or whether it's a neutron which caused the proton recoil uh, in some experiments you also use cryogenic bolometers and then you have vitro detectors you have detector arrays and most importantly this is something that is uh, will come up in the future namely recoil mass separators because if you are looking at very tiny cross sections and with the, you know the possibility of huge backgrounds swamping your signal then recoil mass separators are the answer and in fact there are uh, a few labs which have already built these and will uh, use them for experiments uh where uh, you know you have huge uh, background and so on of course traditionally these have been used to measure uh, small uh, tiny cross sections but with a nuclear physics uh, interest uh, also they have been used in so called super heavy element searches the gas field the recoil mass so this is a component which will be used in the future uh, more and more okay uh, then i just mention something about targets because uh, accelerators will produce beams but they have to impinge on targets and these targets again there is a huge variety of targets that are used the solid targets so they can be thin self supporting at higher energies or they can be backed you can have a very thin target they put on a backing uh, because you need a very high current so then this heat that is generated by the beam stopping uh, not in the main target itself but in the backing mainly because you want the targets to be thin so that the energy loss in that is very tiny because you want to scan this as a function of energy i told you that the the cross section drops dramatically because uh, with the, as you lower the energy uh, which is the uh, place where you are interested in uh, then the energy loss becomes very important and therefore uh, you have to put high currents but then since the target will get damaged the backing has to be cooled by either water or alcohol or sometimes by liquid nitrogen as well these targets solid targets are prepared by evaporation using either resistive heating or ion sputtering or electron beam heating and so on uh, they can also be made by implanting so you can also uh, implant the target into a backing 
so that uh, for instance gaseous targets like uh, uh, nitrogen or oxygen these are made sometimes this way or deuterium uh, so they go and you know each every ion of a certain energy has a certain stopping length so it goes inside and uh, of course there is a scatter around the, that stopping length so that contributes to the you know un slight uncertainty in the energy at which you are measuring this cross section but uh, this is very useful when you have especially uh, rare targets of uh, and especially of gases and uh, rare gases at that okay uh, you can also use gas jet targets and they are uh, very useful when for instance you have when you uh, uh, put in very large currents because uh, uh, gas doesn't get damaged you have a gas jet so even if the uh, even if the uh, gas atom or molecule uh, breaks up uh, you have the next uh, set of atoms coming in because it's a jet and usually these are supersonic jets uh, where the state of art uh, is 10 to the 19 such atoms or molecules per square centimeter over a very tiny uh, dimension of 2 mm by 2 mm so of course you can go thinner i mean once you can make such a thick target of course you can go thinner by even a million pole then to the 13 so in cases where the cross sections are much higher you could use a thinner target and where the cross sections are smaller you can use a thicker target provided uh, the energy loss in that is manageable i mean it is so that is decided by the experimental uh, requirements you can also use in some cases a target uh, as a gas detector i mean uh, suppose you have a gas target and you can make a detector ionization uh, detector for instance and you can use this as a target come detector for instance it can be of uh, hydrogen and uh, or it can be of ch4 methane and so on and at very low energy you can even mix it with argon which is the so called uh, uh, classic uh, gas that is used in uh, ionization chambers uh, p10 gas but then uh, the argon will not contribute because uh, you are already at uh, do enough energy that that barrier is so high that that doesn't contribute uh impurities in the target are extremely important for instance uh, this is just one example in the uh, radiative capture of uh, the alpha particle by carbon 14 uh, leading to oxygen 16 plus a proton uh, 13 carbon is a very nasty impurity and so people of course use enriched uh, uh, carbon 12 that means carbon 13 is about 1% in natural carbon so you reduce that by a factor of 100 but some at the lowest energies even that is uh, causes uh, problems in the experiment so in fact this experiment has to be done in inverse kinematics so you have to have a pure helium gas jet target and you shoot a carbon 12 beam and then because this uh, of this background still uh, there are oxygen 16 that can come in and so on so then you require uh, to actually use a recoil mass separator to separate this out and you require to also use combination of electric and magnetic fields to make sure that what you are seeing at the focal plane is only oxygen 16 nothing else okay this is just an estimate which i have given uh, please don't i mean you can see the slides later but this is just a uh, you know experimenters use this uh, for back of the envelope calculations to see what is the kind of counter rate that you get so in short this is about uh, four times the thickness in microgram per square centimeter divided by a of the uh, target times the current in microamperes and the cross section in picobands and the efficiency so this gives the count rate in so many events per second uh, i missed out that this this gives the events per second anyway this is just uh, an aside okay this is a picture for instance of the gas jet target the state of art gas jet target called um, uh, what is that jensa uh, jensa i think that that's the name i actually can't see the heading again But can can I just go back and then uh, you know make the maximize this or something? I seem to have uh, got the full screen earlier, uh, or maybe I can do it at the, at a later stage when I go to the uh, other second half of this talk. Okay, so this is the gas jet target. So you have uh, uh, you know a nozzle which uh, puts out that gas at uh, supersonic speeds, and that is taken up by this receiver, and then that uh, heavy gas load is actually pumped by roots pumps and similarly there are uh, pumps here because this is a windowless gas target so the beam comes in uh, probably from this end and uh, there are chambers here which are pumped out by very uh, strong pumps on either side so that the beam vacuum on the side of the accelerator or of the 
the downstream uh, where you have, uh, might have a Faraday cup or something that is not disturbed. Uh, so as I said, the state of art is that you can go up to 10 to the 19 atoms per square centimeter. Okay, now I come to uh, an important concept, namely that of the so-called gamma peak. Now, as you know, the uh, in a star you have a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution which. Uh, uh, goes something like this at uh, the higher energies. So, given a temperature T, goes like a, it goes down exponentially with the uh, energy of that particle. Let's say the proton, or the alpha particle, um, and uh, the uh, tunneling uh, through the barrier has a dependence like this: exponential minus uh, root of eg by e, uh, where uh, it's this eg by e is like this is. This comes from this uh, uh, Sommerfeld parameter, uh, basically, and uh, that, uh, of course, depends on the uh, Coulomb uh, charges of the uh, target and projectile. So the Coulomb barrier, let's just estimate that. The Coulomb barrier can be estimated as just the product of the two charges, projectile and target, and divided by the sum of their radii, which to first, just uh, if you want to make an order of magnitude estimate, it's just a projectile to the one third plus a target to the one third. So, if you look at the P plus beryllium 7 system, it's about 2.52 MeV. Now, uh, the core temperature, as I said, in the sun, for instance, is 15 million degrees, and this is about 1.3 keV. So, you're way below the Coulomb barrier. Okay? So, if the tunneling through the barrier goes down like this with the energy, uh, as you lower the energy, uh, the uh, probability that you have higher and higher energy particles also goes down exponentially. If you multiply these two, that gives you a measure of how many reactions are taking place uh, in the star uh, per second, let's say, per unit time. Okay? Uh, now, if you take a product of this, then you get a peak-like structure. And this is called uh, gamma peak because it involves uh, tunneling through the barrier, which was first calculated by gamma in uh, connection with the uh, alpha uh, decay. Uh, he was the first one to use quantum mechanics uh, and the concept of tunneling to estimate what are the alpha uh, decay half-lives. So, okay. So, as I said, this is where you want to measure the cross-section. At least, uh, maybe uh, even if you can go down to uh, somewhere halfway here, that's where you want to measure the cross-section. As you can see, this is this the cross-section will be very tiny, and quite often it uh, goes down to uh, not just picobans but to femtobans. Okay. So, with the uh, best targets that you can get and with the highest current that you can get, which might be running into hundreds of microamperes of protons, let's say, uh, you get about a count in a, you know, in a month or something like that. So, in any case, since there is a very strong dependence of the cross-section as you lower the energy, uh, what astrophysics uh, people use is a so-called S factor, the astrophysical S factor that is given here. I think I can use this is the PowerPoint, so I should be able to use the uh, pointer options, the laser pointer. Okay. So, so uh, this is the so-called S factor, the astrophysical S factor. So you can parameterize the cross section in terms of the S factor by E and multiply it by this exponential uh, factor. So when you uh, actually extract the S factor, it is sigma E times exponential two pi eta times E. So E sigma E uh, times this exponential factor. So it basically removes the exponential dependence, uh, which would uh, otherwise you know, mean that you have to plot these cross sections on a log log scale and so on. So this kind of linearizes this uh, uh, cross section, the, the, the astrophysical, the cross section of astrophysical interest. Now, in this particular thing, you can put down the constants, and this uh, 2 pi eta turns out to be about 30 times uh, the product of the charges Z1, Z2. I mean, the, the charge numbers of the nuclei and uh, square root of the reduced mass by energy, where energy is uh, the center of mass energy in KEV. Okay, so one such example of this, and I'll also maybe uh, say later about what are the uh, some, some configurations of experimental setups also. Uh, but one such measurement, uh, one such key measurement was done by the uh, group in Gran Sasso, and that's called the LUNA collaboration. Uh, and this is from their publication, 
where they have measured these cross sections in uh, even below the gamma of heat. Okay, so as you can see, this is an extremely the energy scale. By the way, is a long scale. So uh, this is 100 keV, and what they have measured the gamma of peak for this uh, happens to be about uh, slightly more than 20 keV for the helium-3 helium-3 system, uh, and they have measured it down to halfway down below the gamma peak. So this is a fantastic measurement. And I think I've, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the last point here is just one count, plus minus one count, okay? So, the, uh, and that I think uh, they, they got in about a month or so, counting. So you can also see that this, uh, as I said, this S factor, uh, the way it is parameterized is the cross section times E. And the rest of it, since it's an exponential, of course, that doesn't have any uh, units, uh, any dimensions. So uh, this kind of linearizes this uh, cross section. Uh, there is a smooth dependence, of course. And in fact, the slight increase that you see here is because of the fact that uh, you have these uh, uh, you know, shielded nuclei. That is, the atoms uh, consist of nuclei and their surrounding electrons. So the surrounding electrons actually contribute to shielding the a positive charge and they actually help come the uh, help the projectile come a little more close to the uh, target than otherwise than if they were bare nuclei so the shielded nuclei uh, s factor is slightly more so you have to account for that as well okay and uh, this is a measurement okay i can't see uh, what this uh, measurement is. i think it's the d plus p measurement if i'm not mistaken uh, no, it is uh, deuteron okay. alpha particle. Deuteron alpha particle giving you the uh, six liter. Okay, that, that is of uh, uh, interest to nucleosynthesis in the very early stages of the universe, the so called Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Okay, so this uh, these measurements were important in that context because the earlier measurements were all upper bounds, they, they only put certain upper bounds. Uh, given by these arrows. So the cross section was less than some bound here. Uh, and there was even, in fact, at very low energy, there are some bound which was much higher. So they said, maybe there is even a, a resonance there. In any case, Luna made these measurements at uh, very low energies and uh, showed that, uh, you know, you, you can indeed measure these cross sections. And uh, for instance, here, the cross section is measured to about 20, 30% accuracy, which is great. And they also showed uh, that, uh, you know, this is well below the upper bounds that were then existing at that time. Of course, apart from the fact that they measured it at the lowest energies, and this contributed to our understanding of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, also in terms of the uh, ratios of the various uh, species that are produced as compared to the proton abundance. Uh, uh, let me just go back. Yeah. Okay, this is... Uh, this was also using a gas target, uh, a windowless, so-called windowless gas target. So the gas target was here. And since there, it was a radiative capture, they had a very large uh, high purity germanium detector, semiconductor detector, which has uh, pretty good resolution, energy resolution. And uh, since it was a very high current, they actually had a beam calorimeter. So they measured the heat that is produced in the, uh, in the calorimeter. And that way they calibrated the current that is uh, coming in, in the beam. Uh, of course, they did it uh, at an underground location where the muon flux was down by a factor of, uh, I think, 10 to 100 million. Uh, they have a one and a half kilometer or so depth. Uh, but in spite of that, to shield the uh, local radioactivity, uh, they have a lead shield here. So this is a kind of typical experiment for uh, radiative capture measurements. Uh, what is perhaps not shown is any veto detector, but some experiments also use veto detectors to remove the contributions of the remnant muons that are there. Okay, so this is an example, for instance, of the 14 nitrogen uh, radiative capture of protons, which again the Luna collaboration uh, has measured. Uh, so they, this is an example of a spectrum that they see. Uh, this is the uh, region of interest, and these are all due to uh, backgrounds which are. Uh, uh, which uh, exist and which have to be uh, dealt with. So this is the 14 nitrogen p gamma, but there is also a small amount of 15 
uh, nitrogen in the gas and this contributes to this small peak here and so on. The, the major background is of course below about uh, 2.6 MeV uh, or let's say roughly 3 MeV and uh, there are some isotopes of course which emit uh, uh, you know, background uh, gamma rays which are slightly higher in energy. So this, if I'm not mistaken, would probably correspond to the 2.6 MeV gamma ray. And then there are bumps coming because there are residual neutrons which get captured and then give uh, escape peaks and so on. So, But beyond about 2.6 MeV, the spectrum continuously falls. And at very high energy, the contribution is mainly because of uh, neutrons either produced through uh, alpha N reactions, alpha coming from the radioactivity or from muons that produce some radioactivity and uh, you know, that, that kind of background. Vivek, when yeah. you say laboratory background, yeah. it is from the rock surrounding... Uh, yeah, yeah. The alpha particles from the rock, they can make reactions in the rock material, produce neutrons, and neutrons are relatively harder to stop. Uh, I mean, so this is, is not a good uh, thing to stop. So, I, 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 in some of these experiments, they actually use paraffin or even water to mm -hmm. attenuate the neutrons. Because this accelerator is underground. Yeah, this accelerator is underground. So the muon background is, uh, uh, I mean, reduced uh, quite a bit, but uh, radioactivity is still there. Of course, it helps that they have, I think, a background from more or less chalk-like uh, material. So uh, their background is, for instance, uh, much less than, uh, let's say, the rock that we have at Madurai. Okay. You can also also much more uranium and thorium okay. than the rock, uh, uh, the kind of rock that they have. Yeah, yeah. Which is basically, uh, I think, calcium carbonate. So you can also take a question here. Yeah, sure. How, how is the S factor physically important? Uh, S factor is basically a measure of the cross section. Huh. Okay. So you can compute, as I said, you can compute the cross section from this relationship. This is just, I mean, this is just another representation of the cross section. But if you want to plot this cross section, as I said, because of this tunneling uh, in nuclei, you, it will go down exponentially. So you'll have to do a semi-log plot or maybe a log-log plot. Uh, so this basically linearizes the, uh, you know, the cross-section. And uh, for visualization, this becomes much uh, easier. So you can make graphs of this and you, know, you can see if there is a resonance. For instance, if there is a resonance, it will show up in the S-factor. Okay. But it's the same thing. I mean, you are not, uh, uh, you know, it's the same data that produces this S-factor. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the cross-section and the S-factor, okay? Because you know all these other quantities. You know the energy, you know the reduced mass, you know the uh, charges on the nuclear. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's a question on the chat, so. Yeah, okay. Ah, with this, I, with this full screen, I cannot see the chat, unfortunately. Or I don't know whether there is some way of doing that. No, that's why I read it for you. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I move uh, to another such cross-section. Again, I can't see the heading, uh, but, uh, okay, it's the first measurement of the... Okay, so that, that was a setup. Up so for you. This is the cross-section, 14 nitrogen P-gamma cross-section. Uh, again, uh, going down to uh, gamma energies, okay? So the earlier measurements, in fact, I think this, these circles here are uh, from some uh, measurement which was done overground, if I'm not mistaken. And that, in fact, also showed a, a resonance-like structure, which uh, was not seen in the much better experiment, I believe, of the Luna group. And so they don't see any resonance. And in fact, you can see how much the cross-section has changed. From four, uh, from an S-factor of 4 keV ban, it has come down almost by a factor of 2, or a little more than a factor of 2. Okay? So this has dramatically changed. And this has consequences in all these nuclear synthesis uh, computations. So, so you can see that measurements uh, uh, sometimes uh, could be even be wrong, uh, and uh, it needs two or three or more groups, uh, depending on the importance of that measurement, to actually pin down the actual cross section. Okay? And also, you can see that these overground measurements have large error bars, whereas the Luna has extremely tiny error bars in this region, uh, and they grow only when you go down to gamma energies. Uh, but that's where the, uh, the cross-section is needed. Okay. Uh, then I come to uh, some self-advertisement. Uh, 
one of the important cross sections uh, for the uh, solar neutrino problem is the cross section 7 beryllium plus proton going to 8 boron plus photon is the radiative capture of a proton by 7 beryllium now 7 beryllium happens to be a radioactive nucleus it has a half life of about 45 days or so and uh, so uh, there had been many measurements uh, in uh, uh, in, the, in the US, in uh, France, in Germany, and so on. Uh, uh, and also uh, Coulomb breakup measurements, dissociation measurements, uh, Coulomb dissociation measurements. But the, uh, the direct measurements and the Coulomb dissociation did not agree. And there was almost a 20% uh, mismatch between these measurements. And also, I think there was one measurement, which was the radiative capture of uh, beryllium-7, an early measurement, of course, which also did not agree with the later measurements. So we decided uh, because there was uh, at that time around uh, the late 90s, uh, a very smart guy in uh, the IUAC in Delhi developed the first uh, radioactive ion beam in India. Uh, and this was just, of course, it was only one beam, seven beryllium beam, but that beam was uh, used in about five or six different experiments. And it had a, a very nice property about it in that many of these radioactive beams at that time were uh, quite impure. Sometimes the, uh, the nucleus of interest would only be, or the beam of interest would only be 20%. So it was really a cocktail beam. Whereas this one, because it made use of the recoil mass separator that existed there and was used for other measurements, he converted it, uh, I mean, he made some modifications to it so that it became one of the purest radioactive ion beams in the world, now, greater than 99.9% purity. In fact, this is also out of some modesty because there is another nine here, but, uh, you know, uh, J.J. Das, uh, who developed this, uh, gave, said, said that this is the number that you should put forth. Okay, in any case, this uh, size was very small. Many of the radioactive ion beams uh, elsewhere were having sizes of the order of uh, 25 millimeter or so, 25 by 25. So this has a, a size which is almost like the size that you get from DC uh, machines like the Pelletron or the uh, or cascade generators and so on. Very precise. Uh, <coughs> in terms of spatial uh, size. Also, the angular spread was very tiny. And this was also another characteristic, only one degree. And this was done at, as I said, using the recoil mass separator in a slightly different mode. Uh, he all, we also built a detector at the focal plane. So you made the measurement of the reaction. Uh, and uh, this uh, measurement actually used only 300 uh, beryllium-7 ions per second. That was the kind of beam intensity. Uh, to be contrasted with typical beams of a few nanoamperes, uh, which are about 10 to the power of 10 particles per second in, let's say, the pelletron, or even sometimes higher than that. Okay? So this is uh, six to seven orders of magnitude smaller. So you have to build a very efficient detector. And of course, you have to have a cross-section which is measurable. So we used an indirect method here. So we used a deuterium uh, target. It was a poly, uh, propylene target where all the protons, or more or less all the protons, replaced by deuterium and then we looked for this transfer reaction and then using a technique called the so-called asymptotic normalization method and making an ancillary measurement to pin down the errors somewhat we did also elastic scattering measurement seven beryllium on the deuterium target uh, we came uh, so we measured the elastic scattering as i said we did an analysis in a slightly at that time we thought quite state of art because we made many many combinations um, uh, and uh, you know sort of uh, Monte Carloing it uh, uh, to get the cross section and then also putting a systematic error on the S factor. So we got an S factor uh, to cut a long story short, uh, denoted by this uh, uh, red point, okay, this uh, square, red square. Sorry. And the other points are, I think, due to, let me see, I, have I got it right? I hope it is right. Maybe in the course of narrowing it, I think, uh, I think there is a problem here. I think in the when I slightly change the size of this slide, this actually refers to this point here, I think, ANC transfer. Okay, so this arrow has shifted. So you can see that now this agrees with the direct p gamma measurements, uh, rather than some of these uh, Coulomb breakup measurements. So uh, we have made in this measurement we have made about a 10% measurement of the S factor, and we said that this would be useful for making uh, rough measurements at the 10% level of uh, in, in cases where you have short-lived nuclei, you can make them uh, as, uh, you know, radioactive ion beams 
uh, and make this uh, capture measurement through this indirect method of transfer. So you transfer a proton onto the beryllium-7 and uh, you infer the cross-section using some theory, uh, the so-called asymptotic normalization method. Okay, so this is the end of this uh, part of the talk. And uh, now let me go to the other part. So let me see. I should probably stop share. Uh, and then this is, this is full screen. Okay. I share the screen corresponding to the other uh, three. Okay, here it is. And uh, sorry, I have to start from the beginning. Uh, can you all see the slides? Yes, sir. Hello? Okay. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. So now, uh, as I said, we, we had discussed some of the uh, lighter elements that are produced in stars such as the sun. Uh, and now we'll come to the making of heavier elements. So, of course, in the initial part, from these light elements uh, to, let's say, iron, uh, that, that they involve uh, reactions involving charged particles, uh, protons and alphas mostly. Uh, but also sometimes uh, carbon and uh, oxygen. But then in the later stages, uh, you can't do this because of the binding energy curve. And then you have to make use of neutrons. So nature does make use of neutrons. And uh, there are the so-called slow neutron captures and rapid neutron captures. And that's how you make the heaviest elements. And uh, as I said, very recently, we have also seen uh, the case of uh, a neutron star, neutron star merger through uh, gravitational waves that were detected uh, and uh, that is probably the site for much of the heavy element production. Although uh, it, uh, the supernova do contribute uh, somewhat to the heaviest elements, but probably the major part of it comes from these captures. This is the, our present understanding. Okay. It may change over a period of time. Okay, so I'll, uh, in this uh, part I'll discuss, let me see, I am at five o'clock now. And so I have uh, another half an hour or so. Well, let's see, I hope I will go get there. So I'll talk about a little bit about the life cycle of stars, how you cross the A equal to 8 bottleneck and you make carbon. And of course, as you, and then elements up to iron nickel and then finally the heaviest of the elements. <clears throat> so these are the references. Uh, the seminal paper of uh, the two Burbages, Fowler and Hoy, uh, this was way back in 1957. Then there are uh, follow-ups of that, uh, you know, putting in uh, uh, measurements that were done, but what are the measurements that are required, pointing them out and so on. And this was in a set of uh, two articles by a big group in the US and uh, Europe. Uh, I think there are some 50, 40, 50 authors in that. Uh, but uh, Adelberger, uh, since he has, a, uh, he's one of the very important figures in this. Uh, so. The reviews of modern physics uh, in 1998 and 2011. So it relates to the solar fusion and zero cycles. And then there is a big compilation by Angelo, which was made in 1999. So it's a bit dated now, but uh, it made a very thorough compilation of the uh, you know, uh, thermonuclear reaction rates uh, as inferred from the cross sections. Okay, so let's recap. Uh, a gas cloud of hydrogen comes together under the gravitational interaction and forms a young star. As it becomes more massive, uh, pressure and temperature builds up. Uh, so I'm just basically re re uh, recalling what uh, Amul has said in his, I think, first talk. Uh, so as it becomes more and more massive, then these uh, quantities build up, pressure and temperature, and uh, you can ignite the PP fusion uh, reaction and indeed the chain of uh, uh, the PP chain. For stars less than about three times the uh, mass of the sun, uh, this star, uh, this first reaction is extremely slow. So the star has a long lifespan of about uh, 10 uh, billion years or so. Now, in this case, when the nuclear fusion stops, the star contracts. Uh, and then, of course, when it contracts, the gravitational uh, energy is given up to heat. So it heats up. So the outer parts expand from the red giant into a nebula. But then the core contracts because the temperature is high, it forms some, it goes through some other reactions and ultimately it lands up as a white dwarf. And uh, that it stays that way because then the electron degeneracy pressure, uh, 
because electrons don't like to come together. They are uh, uh, Fermi Dirac particles. So the Pauli principle prevents two electrons of the same quantum number to sit on top of each other. And that's what uh, is uh, translates into an electron degeneracy pressure, which holds back further contraction. And since it is uh, light, then this star uh, doesn't have enough gravitational push to uh, you know bring things together. And that's the way it stays. It cools slowly and becomes a so-called brown dwarf. For heavier stars, after using up their fusion fuel, uh, ending with uh, iron and nickel, and we'll get, come to what are the reactions that are involved beyond the PP cycles and the, uh, so on, that uh, it cannot withstand gravity. And this contracts, leading to neutronization. So this was uh, the source of the early neutrinos that come out from such a uh, collapse, uh, so-called neutronization neutrinos. Uh, so the electron combines with the proton to give you a neutron and a neutrino of the electron type. And then eventual explosive collapse, uh, which was described in some detail by Amol, and he will uh, continue on that uh, in the next lecture. So you could collapse to form a neutron star with an envelope because now you have neutrons in great quantities, uh, then they can interact with the elements that are there and they can use heavier elements. So this was the uh, this was what we thought was the way you could produce heavier elements, right? All the way up to uranium and so on. For stars which are heavier than that, heavier than about 10 solar masses, the neutron degeneracy pressure also cannot hold back gravity. And then it could lead, for instance, to a black hole. So this is uh, a picture taken from a, uh, an article in Wikipedia. And uh, you can see that you start out with the molecular cloud. And then uh, you can go on. If it is a low mass, you can go to uh, red giant and so on, ultimately white dwarf and then a black dwarf. But if it is heavier, it's more massive, then you can go, you can have nuclear reactions and so on. And you can go into this uh, type 2 supernova, which was uh, more short sure that it was seen uh, through uh, in 1987. And then it can lead to uh, a supernova remnant, such as the Crab Nebula, for instance, uh, or indeed this SN 1987 uh, remnant. Uh, so it can lead to a neutron star. But if it is more massive, then of course it can lead to a black hole. And then this black hole can be spinning. It can have angular momentum. So you have an accretion disk where matter falls in and then you have X-ray emission as a result of that. Uh, if you have a neutron star branch, then of course, uh, very often, more often than not, these uh, have a magnetic uh, moment which and a magnetic field which is extremely high. And then if this is misaligned with the angular momentum, then you can have radiation from there and you can actually see it as a pulsar. Okay, so now we come to the nuclear astrophysics part that how do you cross this barrier of uh, A equal to eight? Now, 8 beryllium lives, as I said uh, some time ago, that it lives for about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. It's a very narrow resonance of about a few electron volt width, and uh, uh, but it's, it lives for a very short time. Now, Bethe proposed in 1939 that you can have a 3-alpha reaction, which produces carbon-12. Then carbon-12 is, of course, stable, and then you can capture alpha and proton reactions and so on. You can go through the CNO cycle and even further reactions with proton and alpha. But how do you get to carbon-12? That is a bottleneck. So uh, the, the best idea of three alphas coming together is, uh, doesn't really work because to find three alphas at the same place is extremely difficult. You don't have such conditions even in the densest of uh, such stars. Uh, so uh, uh, there was a proposal uh, by, I think, OPIC and the... Uh, then this was worked on by both him and as well as Saltpeter, namely that the production of carbon could be in two steps. First of all, you have a resonant production of 8 beryllium, and then you can have alpha capture uh, producing carbon 12. That's possible. However, it turns out that uh, even that rate turned out to be too low. Uh, then Hoyle came up with this brilliant idea that it's not just enough to have uh, an alpha capture on 8 beryllium, but you have to have a state in carbon-12 at just the right energy. And so then you can have a resonant enhancement of that capture cross-section. So he predicted that there should be a state in carbon-12 at 7.6 MeV. And this was his uh, paper in 1953. And uh, in fact, the, even before it got published, uh, the word got round and uh, uh, Dunbar did the experiment. 
And so this is what I will show in the next slide. Dunbar did this experiment where he showed that there is this state at 7.68 MeV through this reaction, nitrogen 14 D-alpha going to excited states in carbon. So you can actually look at the alpha spectrum. So this is a plot of the alpha energy spectrum. And this was done with a spectrometer, a magnetic spectrometer. And uh, you can, uh, magnetic spectrometer actually does uh, analysis of momentum by charge. And if the charge is typically two, then it's basically momentum can be directly related to the energy. So he did that with a, uh, this, this group, Dunbar and company did this experiment uh, uh, using a, a particular target. And they found that there are no other groups uh, at the level of 1% uh, of this 4.4 MeV group here. Okay, so This is actually divided by 20. So uh, they look similar in scale. So this is typically, this peak is about 5% of this, okay? slightly less than 5%, 4%. And uh, they did not observe any other peak uh, in this whole range of 3.7 to 7.4 MeV. So they, they only found this, uh, this, this refers to the alpha energy, by the way. And so at 4.6, alpha energy, you have a, a peak corresponding to an excitation energy of 7.68 MeV in the carbon 12. Okay? So this state was very quickly identified and this, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, vindicated uh, the, uh, the theory of uh, Hoyle that there, must, there has to be such a state which can cause a resonant enhancement. So I just want to show you that uh, 8 beryllium is also an unbound state in, in the ground state. It decays by two alphas. It has a width of about seven electron volts. And of course, it has excited states and so on, which we did not get into. But uh, this uh, width of 6.8 uh, e electron volts, by the way, this has been measured in very low energy uh, experiments, accelerator experiments. It was measured quite early. In fact, the energy is so low, it is about 92 keV in the center of mass. Uh, and with the resolutions that you can get, you also see atomic structure effects on the cross section, uh, beautiful. And this is, uh, uh, you can look it up if you like, uh, but in any case, the width uh, can be then related to the lifetime. That's about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So the beryllium eight is produced in a stellar core of, uh, but living only for 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And unless you have this, this state here at 7.6 MeV in carbon 12. Uh, so the alpha particle, which comes in with, at a few tens of keV Actually, I think it's about 200 kV or so. So it's on the tail of the energy spectrum of the Boltzmann spectrum uh, star. Uh, then it can populate this, but in a resonant way. And then once this is populated, of course, then it decays. Uh, it can sometimes decay back into the alpha beryllium channel, but uh, there is sufficient decay uh, to through two gamma rays, uh, 3.2 and 4.4, in that that ultimately will form carbon 12. So this is a brilliant uh, prediction of Hoyle. Uh, in fact, when uh, Fowler got his Nobel Prize, he, he uh, it should have been that Hoyle should have also shared this Nobel Prize. Because not only was he part of that uh, seminal paper, uh, which uh, you know laid out the you know how nuclei are synthesized uh, in the universe, but uh, th this was a very key idea. Because unless you cross this A equal to eight uh, barrier, you don't get to carbon 12 and you can't make the heavy elements. And carbon, of course, is the, uh, to start with, is the uh, most essential element for any life on Earth or elsewhere. Okay, so then the next reactions that go on are carbon oxygen burning. We already saw the CNO cycle yesterday. So you can, uh, through proton and alpha reactions on carbon, you can go all the way up to neon, magnesium, and so on. And you can finally end up with uh, iron okay, through these uh, proton-induced and alpha-induced uh, reactions. Uh, however, then you reach the top of the binding energy per nucleon curve. Uh, and of course, uh, many of you would have heard that iron is the most bound nucleus. Actually, strictly speaking, that is not true. It doesn't matter in this discussion. But 62 nickel is the most uh, bound nucleus, with the largest binding energy per nucleon. Of course, it is not easily produced in uh, stellar conditions, uh, at least in, the, in this part. Because you have, in this part, you have mostly alpha-like nuclei. Okay, so after you reach the top of the binding energy curve, then uh, the uh, fusion reactions are actually having negative Q value. That means they are not exothermic, but endothermic. And therefore, you would require uh, extremely high temperatures because already the Z, 
Z of iron is uh, 26. And so, I mean, you would require extremely high temperatures and these perhaps might, if at all, be possible in only, uh, you know, the most violent conditions in uh, some places in the universe, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but uh, in general, this doesn't happen. And so these fusion reactions stop. And they cannot contribute uh, to the production of heavy element iron. So, in case that happens, of course, then gravity takes over, and you get this explosive uh, you know, breakup of the star. And uh, that's where these neutrons now come in. Now, the neutron doesn't have any Coulomb interaction because it has zero charge, so it can merely penetrate into the nucleus and uh, you know make a nucleus a plus one. And uh, why a plus one? It can go to a plus two. It can go to a plus three. Now, the, so this capture process can continue depending on what the cross sections are for capture. Uh, but they also have competing, they have to compete with beta decays. So as the nucleus becomes more and more neutron rich, it can also decay through the uh, emitting beta minus, right? And as you become more neutron rich, the Q values for beta decay increase. And so the half lives decrease. Uh, the half lives actually go as uh, the energy available to the power of five. So at some point, beta decay will compete very favorably with further neutron capture. And then that's when you will get the higher Z nucleus. And this will also keep on happening, but neutron captures keep on competing. So that's how you'll get to heavy and heavier nuclear. Now in this neutron capture process, there are two, well, I mean, uh, major kind of uh, division that people make, namely so-called slow neutron capture and rapid neutron capture. So in supernova or in maybe the neutron star mergers, you have so-called rapid neutron capture. Uh, things happen in the course of a uh, you know, few seconds or so. Uh, but on a longer time scale, this could happen also uh, if you have reactions that produce neutrons. And one of the possible candidates is the 13 carbon alpha N reaction that produces neutrons. And this could possibly be uh, contributing to uh, neutron producing some more neutron rich nuclei in low mass stars of the order of one to three solar masses. And then of course we'll come to this at the end uh, in the neutron star mergers. So the R process is of course happening in supernova and in neutron star mergers. Okay, so this I've already told. So in slow neutron capture, for instance, you can produce, uh, this is just an example, 58 iron can become 59 iron, which can then beta decay to 59 cobalt and then it can capture something, it can become 60 cobalt, then you can get 60 iron and so on. And um, this sort of process can go on. But the time scales are very long in this case because you don't have too many neutrons. And uh, so between captures, there is enough time for the nucleus to beta decay in case that is possible. Okay. Uh, also, because there are not too many neutrons, you mostly produce uh, very slightly neutron rich nuclei just slightly to the right of the line of stability. Okay. Uh, so these are some other candidates for uh, producing neutrons, which may be relevant to the S process, the slow process that occurs in red giants. So carbon uh, 13 alpha N is one thing, one example that I gave. But you can also have oxygen, oxygen going to 31 sulfur, 14 nitrogen, gamma ray, and then the 18 fluorine uh, interacting with uh, an alpha particle. Uh, through this reaction, muon going to magnesium 25 plus neutron. So this is a series of reactions. So this likelihood is probably less than carbon 13. But in any case, there they are uh, possible processes which can contribute to uh, some small number of neutrons. That I mean, by small I mean relatively small as compared to what is uh, produced in uh, supernova explosion. And they can contribute to this slow neutron capture process. Now, as I said, in the explosive nuclear synthesis you can have uh, a huge number of neutrons. And uh, then, as I said, the neutron capture has to compete with the uh, beta decay. And if uh, beta decay, if uh, it doesn't compete so favorably, in fact, you can reach the neutron trip line. That means uh, for a given Z, you can reach a nucleus, which uh, if it captures a subsequent a neutron, then it becomes particle unbound. You can even reach those neutron dip lines in uh, the supernova explosions or in neutron star, neutron star mergers. Okay, now here is a uh, something that I have taken from one of these sites, uh, the JINA, the Joint Institute of Nuclear Astrophysics site, uh, for, and then they have a uh, very nice uh, clip 
uh, video clip. So here goes. Let's see if it works. Yes, it does work. And so you start out with neutron capture, and then you can go to all these elements, which are very neutron rich. And then later, these will of course decay and make stable uh, nuclei. And in these, you can see that it sort of stops or halts for a while in the magic numbers. And uh, the reason for that is that the neutron capture cross section becomes small at uh, magic numbers. So then it goes to some beta decaying place where uh, it might it is possible that you can get a neutron capture and then this proceeds. Okay. So this is a very nice animation, I thought. But these are very complicated, uh, you know, uh, calculations done on the best supercomputers these days to, uh, you know, estimate what what is the abundances of the various elements that you see. Uh, ultimately uh, coming out of, as a result of these uh, supernova explosions. Okay, so maybe I can, uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, uh, let me play it out again. I can stop at any time. So you can see that these neutron captures are leading to heavier and heavier nuclei, but mostly on the neutron rich side. So this is the Z-axis uh, axis of number of protons and this is number of neutrons. Okay. This is not there in the animation. Uh, and these are the so-called uh, waiting points where the nucleus waits, it beta decays, and then it captures a neutron. Okay. So, so now some these uh, points here denote uh, thorium and uranium. Okay, so you can produce elements even way beyond that. Perhaps you can even produce uh, elements like californium and einsteinium and so on, but their decay half lives are so short, and uh, many of these uh, supernova explosions take place so far away that uh, perhaps as of now, we don't have techniques to uh, know whether these elements are really produced. Okay. So, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, are there any questions? Sorry. I had a comment. So this yes. simulation is lasts for, I, I notice about 10 seconds. Is that? Yes, big, that's right. That's so right. the first 10 seconds starting from Big Bang. Is that yes. how you count it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So, I think the time also would be given here. Yeah, the, the time here went till 10 seconds. That's what I Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So if I go, I can I go a little faster. I can come yeah. to the end. Yeah, so here it is. So this is, of course, very long, but most of the things actually, the, the, on this time scale, actually, is mostly beta decays that is taking place. But the creation of these neutron rich, as you said, I'm all correct. This is of the order of uh, 10 seconds or so. That's right. Okay, and uh, now we believe that the heaviest elements, or at least the major part of these heavy elements, or major fraction of these heavy elements, are produced in so-called neutron star, neutron star mergers. Actually, uh, even before this was seen, the uh, many of these nuclear astrophysicists were actually uh, saying that there is a problem. We are not producing enough of the neutron-rich nuclei. So, is there another source of this? And some people had indeed speculated that maybe it is taking place in neutron star, neutron star mergers. But, uh, uh, I mean, it was a great thing that uh, gravitational waves uh, told us that such a, a merger has taken place. And indeed, uh, this merger was seen not just through gravitational waves, but also uh, because it produces all these, uh, you know, X-rays and light and so on. So it was seen in the optical uh, band, in the X-ray band, and also in the RF, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Of course, since it was very far away, we could not observe any neutrinos, although uh, I think there were some upper bounds put by the detectors that were uh, indeed uh, looking uh, for neutrinos, other neutrinos. Okay? So they, they just put upper bounds, but they are not very significant because this turned out to be very far away, 130 million light years away. Uh, okay. Uh, now, again, I don't see the top part of it, but this is the simulation that has been done, which includes both... Uh, you know, uh, elements produced in supernova as well as in neutron star mergers. And uh, this is a very recent article, uh, Reviews of Modern Physics 2021, uh, which actually computes this. And so they can actually reproduce fairly uh, reasonably the abundance of these uh, elements. Of course, there are uh, differences between what implementation you have for the mass formula and cross section and so on. But uh, in, a, in a broad sense, they actually reproduce uh, the abundance of the heavy elements, right down to the heaviest of them all. Uh, this is, of course, compared to the uh, abundance in the sun. So this is the solar abundance in these uh, 
black points. Okay, so this is a picture. This is actually the periodic table. Uh, uh, the periodic table, I think they, this is uh, what, uh, 150 years of the periodic table, I think uh, last or last to last year. So there are these very, very many nice uh, pictures made during that time. And for instance, this shows the elements that are made uh, in the Big Bang, in uh, dying Loma stars, in exploding massive stars, uh, these elements, uh, and even in merging neutron stars, which is this uh, purple stuff here. Uh, the green things are these uh, Loma stars. So you can have some of these heavy elements produced there, but uh, the major uh, part of these heavy elements, uh, right up to plutonium, they are supposed to be produced in uh, uh, merging neutron stars. Okay. Uh, now, I think this is either the last or the last to last slide. These are some of the facilities, uh, upcoming or existing facilities, which have been upgraded to look at uh, things which are relevant to nuclear astrophysics. So, uh, right from mass measurements, for instance, there are several traps worldwide. Uh, Triumph, uh, which is a major radioactive ion beam facility in Canada, uh, that has a, one of the leading uh, mass uh, measurement devices, uh, which is based on the penning trap. Uh, there is also a very nice penning trap in CERN Isolde, which makes a uh, large number of uh, radioactive nuclei through their uh, 20 uh, GeV proton synchrotron, the PS. Uh, then you have measurements at Riken, which is the radioactive ion beam factory. Uh, this is the reach of future RIV facilities. Uh, there is also this uh, facility that is coming up in uh, the U.S. called the FRIB. It's a major uh, you know, physics facility in the U.S. Uh, and uh, so, so this shows you know, the various kinds of things or a sample of the various kinds of things that are being done to measure nuclear properties. Uh, you know, first of all, whether they exist at all, whether they are particle bound, because sometimes uh, the models have not predicted these uh, correctly because after all, uh, if something is to be bound or not, it is decided by a few tens of kV and the models are not accurate to that extent. So uh, experimenters have, uh, it has to be uh, finally fixed by experiment. Experiment has to tell whether, uh, so the, in some cases, for instance, I think this happened in the case of fluorine 31. It was predicted to be unbound, but it turned out to be a bound nucleus and whether it's, even its half-life was measured. So there are things like that. So you first find out whether it exists at all. So in that case, you might even, uh, you know, have just 10 of those atoms. Indeed, in the very heavy element side, this does happen. You sometimes measure only two, three or four after months of data taking at the I mean, most powerful machines uh, in terms of currents that you have. So these are in Russia, for instance, and uh, so and, and in GSI. Okay. So again, this is from that same review article. Uh, this is again, same thing, elemental abundance in the solar system as a function of mass number. And uh, this just tells you what are the processes that contribute. So some of these uh, processes are given here, same article. And I, I think I'll stop here. And if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Sir, what is Sir, there are no unanswered questions, sir, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Professor Murthy has already answered the question. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank ah, Vivek, you can tell them about the birds. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, anyway, thank you all very much for your uh, patience in listening to this. Uh, uh, I should, uh, I mean, say that this is the first time I gave a, uh, I mean, a set of lectures on. Uh, uh, Astrophysics, so I thought I should say something about astronomy and uh, the astrophysics per se, uh, then come to nuclear astrophysics. So, uh, you know, this may not be, I've, I've uh, basically, I'm not a, I'm doing this for the first time, so there may be lacuna in my presentation. Uh, coming to this last slide, this was actually prepared by my, this was again a first attempt by my nephew, uh, who is very much interested in wildlife. So, he promises that the next year, uh, this is, as I said, this is his first attempt. Next one will be on uh, tigers. And he has a huge collection of tigers, some of which I've seen with uh, tiger photographs. Uh, and also, he has some videos on that. Uh, this uh, 
is uh, I, I thought quite beautiful because he, I mean, it takes a lot of patience and uh, you know sticketiveness to uh, photograph birds which uh, move about uh, quite rapidly sometimes. And uh, you know, if uh, if anybody of you is interested, you just send me a mail. Uh, I will send you a, a soft copy of this because since this is first attempt, uh, I mean, he has said that you can share it uh, quite freely. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for this informative session. Now, for the next session, we have with us Professor Amol Zige, and the topic is supernova neutrinos flavor conversions. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of the organizers. Over to you, sir. Can you see and hear me well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So let me just share my slides. Okay, and I will do also. Uh, okay, so this is good. Yes. So you can see my slides well. Yes, sir. We can. Okay, just one second. Yes. I will just adjust things so that I can see any comments that have come up. And so, okay, so let's see. Okay, do you want to give people two minutes break uh, before they start uh, a new talk? Uh, no, sir. You can continue, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. So this is this is uh, for everybody. Uh, so we are now going to come back to supernova and uh, neutrinos and the effect of them on each other. So note that this is in some sense quite an intricate topic, and things build up one on top of each other. Okay. So it is uh, quite important that uh, people understand at least most of the things. Uh, most of the concept before you go ahead. So what I'm going to do is at certain points of time, I'll actually stop. And uh, even if uh, you do not ask any questions, I will still take a halt of a minute so that you know, if people have some questions that they take some time to uh, write down, uh, no, even then uh, we will have some. Okay, so, so uh, uh, in today's lecture, I'm going to discuss the flavor conversions of supernova neutrinos or what is also called as the oscillations of supernova neutrinos. Okay, so that's what uh, we will be talking about. Okay, uh, so this is to remind you of what we did in last lecture and some of the things will be what Professor Murthy did. Uh, uh, they are going to appear here. Uh, we will need them to understand today's talk. Okay. So firstly, uh, we should remember that uh, when a supernova explodes, about 10 to the power 58 neutrinos are emitted. Okay? And you realize that it's uh, really, really a large number, it's a huge number. Uh, and that is why uh, no seeing them is important. Uh, as we saw on the first day, uh, more than 99% of the energy of the star is actually emitted in the form of a in from neutrinos from a supernova. Uh, second thing we saw on the first day was that the energies and fluxes of these neutrinos depend on their flavors. Okay, so which means that the overall flux of electron neutrinos and beyond neutrinos will be different. Okay? Also, the overall flux of uh, electron anti neutrinos and beyond anti neutrinos will be different. Okay, so the flavor is, is very important. And uh, that is a very crucial point in what we do. Uh, from what uh, Professor Murthy taught us over the last two days, a few things should be sort of engraved on our mind. Uh, first is that uh, neutrinos have different masses. As a result of this, they can change flavors as they propagate. Okay? This means that electron neutrinos can become muon neutrinos, or muon neutrinos can become tau neutrinos or tau neutrinos can become electron neutrinos and so on and so forth. Uh, this keeps on happening uh, when the neutrinos propagate. Another point that uh, came up was that the amount of these oscillations or amount of liver conversions depend on the surrounding medium, okay? which means is that uh, if the medium is different or the medium has a different density, for example, then there are so-called matter effects or MSW effects which uh, Professor Murthy described in the talks we had a couple of months ago. Okay, so what we are going to study uh, is the following. 
So we are now going to focus on neutrinos and see what happens to them as they start from the core of the star and come all the way here at the Earth. Uh, can you see my cursor moving, please? I can see your cursor. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so now that we know that the neutrino oscillations depend on surrounding medium, we have to worry about what is the surrounding medium. And indeed, neutrinos pass through many, many different varieties of medium when they uh, come to us on the Earth. Very deep inside the core, the density is as high as 10 to the power 14 grams per cc. Okay, so remember that our normal density is about just maybe 1 to 10 grams per cc. Water is 1. This is 10 to the power 14 times, so 100 trillion times as dense as water. Okay? From this, neutrinos come out all the way down to mantle and envelope. When the density becomes quite small, maybe up to 0.1 or even lower, okay, and they escape this. So during the mantle and envelope, they encounter sort of moderate to small densities. Then they come to vacuum and they will travel all this distance to vacuum. So this distance will be uh, you know, maybe kiloparsecs. Okay? And here the density that they see is basically zero. Now, if my detector is here at the Earth, of course, when the neutrinos come here, I will observe them. Okay. On the other hand, if my detector, when the supernova happens, if my detector happens to be on the other side of the Earth, these neutrinos will also pass through the Earth. Okay. And in that case, the neutrinos have to travel again through the Earth. Earth has a density of, of the order of maybe you know, 5 to 10 grams per cc, and it means that uh, surrounding medium is different. So therefore, neutrinos are traveling through a medium which has densities which vary by many, many orders of magnitude. And as a result, the physics of neutrino oscillations changes. And as a reason that uh, the neutrino oscillations in supernova have very rich physics because you see, or the neutrinos see, uh, things at many, many different orders of magnitude. Okay, uh, not any, in fact, no other particle that we know is as fortunate as this which can travel through a straight line all the way starting from 10 to the power maybe 10 grams per cc the, all the way down to vacuum. Okay, no other particle can do that. So therefore these particles, the neutrinos actually uh, are a lot of are very experienced and therefore can tell us something from the experience. Uh, that's what we exactly want to learn. Okay, so this is what we want to learn about flavor conversions. We want to learn how do neutrinos oscillate along this way okay? and when we see them, do these oscillations retain any memory of their path? Okay, as we said, the neutrinos are experienced. Uh, if they come to us, can we learn something from their experience? And can we find out something more about their path? Okay. And that is going to be uh, the aim of this lecture and the next. Okay, so for this, we have to uh, learn about four things. Firstly, I will remind you about due to the masses and mixing. Uh, it will be some kind of uh, recap of what was done by Professor Murthy in the last two lectures of his. Uh, then we'll learn some special things that happen to neutrinos when they pass through MSW resonances. Uh, then we will see what happens to these neutrinos when they come out from mantle to the detector. And finally, I'm going to go back to the core and tell you some very, very special things that happen in the very early stages, no, before they come out of the mantle. Okay, so I have taken this sequence simply because the mantle to detector is something which is uh, very well understood and we know it very concretely. And core is something that is still under investigation. People do not know answers to this. Okay, so uh, uh, any questions so far? Let me just uh, show you this particular diagram and keep it in front of your eyes for about a minute and to sort of tell you exactly what we're going to be studying. Okay? First, we'll study what happens in this envelope and out all the way to the Earth. And then we'll study what happens inside the core. Okay? So I'll just take a simple halt of about uh, 30 seconds or so. If any questions you can ask, otherwise it's a time for you to absorb what I said so far.
think Amol, you can continue. Okay, sure. I also wanted people to have a look at this uh, figure for slightly longer. Okay. Now, let's try to remember neutrino masses and mixing. Okay. The first and important thing that we should know is that uh, the neutrino flavors, electrons, muon, or tau neutrino, do not have fixed masses. Okay. So, what does this mean? This means that if I tell you uh, that is an electron neutrino, what is its mass? Okay. At that time, you should come back and tell me that this question makes no sense because electron neutrino does not have a fixed mass. What does it have? It can have different masses. Okay. Because it mixes, for example, let's take example, let's take an example of two neutrino mixing. Let's say there are only two neutrinos, electron and muon neutrino, and they mixed. Okay. What this means is that when they mix, they form two combinations, which were again, uh, you saw a few days ago, uh, which are called as mass eigenstates, or we can call them as energy eigenstates. Okay. These eigenstates are eigen, well, eigen functions of the Hamiltonian, and therefore they have fixed energies or fixed masses. Okay. However, electron and muon themselves do not have fixed masses. So in this diagram, the red things that you see are electrons, is electron flavor, and blue is muon flavor. So you see that electron flavor is in both mass eigenstates, which means it can either have mass m1 or it can have mass m2. And what mass can it have? We do not know because quantum mechanics allows us to have both of the both different masses. Okay. So this is what is called as mixing of electron and muon flavor. Now, what happens therefore is that because electron is in both of these mass eigenstates, when you produce an electron flavor, it is produced as a combination of both mu1 and mu2. Okay. Because the combination of mu1 and mu2, after some time, the mixing between mu1 and mu2 changes. And as a result, some of the electron neutrino becomes muon neutrino. Okay. So this is how quantum mechanics functions. Suppose you have certain eigenvalues, and you actually start with initial condition, which is not an eigenvalue, then the, there is a mixing and oscillation. It's a standard uh, quantum mechanics phenomena which is observed in many, many processes. However, important thing to talk about when you look at neutrinos is that when you see neutrino oscillations, let's say from the sun or from the atmosphere, this is quantum mechanics happening at very, very large length scales. Right? I mean, even if you look at the Earth's atmosphere, uh, atmospheric neutrino oscillate over the distance like uh, thousands of kilometers, like uh, the radius of the Earth. Okay, so if tomorrow somebody comes and tells you that quantum mechanics takes place only at atomic scales, you can go and tell that person that you are incorrect. Indeed, I know one phenomenon in quantum mechanics which takes place over thousands of kilometers, uh, which is neutrino oscillations. Okay, uh, neutrino that come from the sun travel over 10 to the power 13 centimeters. So we could say that in fact, no, those oscillations take place over a uh, time scale of 10 to the power 13 centimeters. So quantum mechanics is not simply a phenomenon of small scales. It can happen even at large scales. And neutrinos give us a concrete example of this. Okay. One thing that we must remember while we do this is that the mixing of neutrinos, how much of mu1 is red and how much of mu2 is red depends on matter. Okay, Surrounding matter or surrounding electron density to be very, very precise. If the surrounding density changes, then the fraction of electron and fraction of muon in these two eigenstates will change. Okay, and that is what was discovered by uh, Bikhev, Wolfenstein, and Smirnov, and is called as the MSW resonance or MSW effect. Okay, this was about two neutrinos, and this was an approximation, right? But now we know that there are three neutrinos, therefore they will mix. So what happens is that the three neutrino eigens uh, flavor state, which are electron neutrino which is red, muon neutrino, which is green, and tau neutrino, which is blue, when colors are my imagination, they mix to give three different mass eigenstates, which are given by m1, m2, and m3. Okay, these eigenstates are called as mu1, mu2, and mu3. Uh, all of these eigenstates have different fractions of different flavors. So electron flavor is more in this, in mu1, smaller in mu2, and even smaller in mu3. Okay, and similarly about uh, two and three. Uh, we saw that we have measured the differences in mass squares of these. So solar neutrino experiments they told us difference between m2 square and m1 square. 
which is called uh, tan square solar it's about uh, 10 to the power minus 5 electron volt square times 8 uh, atmospheric experiments tell us that is a daytime square atmospheric, which is about 2.4 times 10 power minus 3 electron volts. Okay. Now, what I try to do is I have to arrange these three u1, u2, and u3 and try to see how they fit well. Okay. Turns out that they can fit well in two patterns. One pattern is this, uh, in which the small difference is below the large difference, and the second pattern is this where the small difference is above the large difference. Okay, So this means that in the first case, uh, M3 is largest. In the second case, M3 is smallest. Okay, The first case is called as normal ordering. It's sometimes called as normal hierarchy. The second case is called inverted ordering or inverted hierarchy. Okay, So you will use these uh, words very often. It is called as normal and inverted ordering. We do not know. Uh, which one nature has chosen. And as you will see in the case of supernova, different hierarchies will give rise to different predictions. Okay, so these are going to be the two hierarchies we are going to refer to. Okay, so this was about uh, mixing of, uh, of neutrinos. Okay. And now what we will do is now we will look at what happens when neutrinos pass through uh, different uh, matter. Okay, so again, I'll have a short break to see if people have any questions and if they understood this particular uh, map. No, sir, there are no questions. Okay, no, I, I do want to give people a few seconds to have a look at these uh, these two figures because it's important to. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. Good. So now we will try to see what happens if uh, these neutrinos pass through an MSW resonance. Okay. What is the MSW resonance? Okay. We'll just see very quickly. So I'm repeating again some of the things that were done by Professor Murthy because these equations are important to realize what is happening. So you perhaps saw that when two neutrino, in the two neutrino mixing case, when neutrinos propagate, uh, uh, there is an effective Hamiltonian, which has parameters given by delta. This delta is the difference in the squares of masses. The second parameter is A. The parameter A depends on the energy of neutrino and also on the value of electron number density. Okay. Now, what happens because of this electron number density, which is again called as matter effect, is that effective value of delta A, the difference in mass square changes. Okay. The effective value becomes something like this. Okay. So you see that delta M, which is the effective value of the different square of masses actually is affected by the value of A. Similarly, effective mixing angle changes and that expression is given by this, which are also shown to you about a couple of days ago. Now we look at this expression and you can notice something interesting which is if I go to a specific case where my A is equal to delta times cosine 2 theta, then this term becomes equal to 0. And when this term becomes equal to 0, what happens to sine square of 2 theta in matter? This is 0. These, are, these two are the same. So this just becomes equal to 1. So this means that when delta times cos 2 theta is equal to A, sine square 2 theta M is equal to 1. Okay. And what does that mean? Remember that our neutrino probability of neutrino conversions was sine square 2 theta times some sine square of oscillation term. Okay. And this means that sine square 2 theta M becomes 1 means that this term becomes maximum possible. So which means that if you are in a situation where A is equal to delta cosine 2 theta, you get maximum convergence. Okay? And therefore, it's called as a resonance. Okay? Note that this is when you are moving through a matter of varying density, you always reach this point because you see, electron uh, number density keeps on changing, large to small. So at some point of time, you will have these two terms become equal. 
and that is called as a as a resonance. Yeah. So there's a question: um, How is there a variance in the mass of neutrino, and does it depend on the medium? Yes. So uh, by definition, the the mass of neutrino are eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, and you see that this matrix has a, a, a expression called has which has a. And A depends on the medium density or electron density. Okay, so therefore, eigenvalues of this matrix will depend on the matter density. Okay, and therefore, the masses of neutrinos, okay, which will depend on the value of electron number density in the medium. Okay, so it is indeed true that effective mass of neutrino depends on the medium it passes through, not the fundamental mass. Okay. But what we are interested in effective mass by which neutrinos actually oscillate. Okay, so how does that work? Okay, it's good to look at this figure, which uh, people in the in the field use very often. So let's try to understand what this figure is. So what I am plotting here is the effective value of mass squared, which is like the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian. Okay, now if I plot the eigenvalues, okay, as a function of a. Uh, this is a equal to zero, which is y-axis, okay. and as a goes to infinity, this eigenvalue of nu two increases like this, in like a linearly, and eigenvalue of nu one does not change. Okay, now just take it for me that this actually happens. Now what this means is that as a goes to infinity, I got two eigenstates, nu one and nu two. One of the eigenstates has this mass, which is given by this. And the second mass uh, grows with density of the nu. Now, for anti-neutrinos, the value of matter potential A changes sign. So, what this means that A, for the same density of matter, has opposite side to neutrino. So, what people do is that instead of plotting different plots for neutrino and anti-neutrino, you say, okay, okay, I make the same plot, but anti-neutrinos I will plot on the negative axis. So what you look when I say this is a, what you understand is that when I go from x-axis to positive side, it means that density is increasing for neutrinos, and if I go from here to negative side, it means that density is decreasing for neutrinos. Okay. So at very very extreme right, which is here, I have very high density, and I'm talking about neutrinos. Okay. At extreme left hand side. I also have very high densities, and but I'm talking about anti-neutrinos. So when I'm deep inside a star, if I want to analyze neutrinos, I will look at this part of my figure. Okay, so I say, okay, deep inside, neutrinos are produced as these two eigenstates: this top one and this left one here. Okay. And then these neutrinos will slowly come out of the star, which means a will decrease, so they will come. Sorry, so they will. Travel leftwards like this from core, and will come back to a equal to zero, which is the vacuum. Okay, that's how they travel to us. What will anti-neutrinos do? They will start on this plot at extreme left end, and start traveling from high densities to low densities, and come slowly here to us. Okay, so this is the vacuum. Okay, is this part clear? So they are actually traveling in the same. Uh, around the, as neighbors of each other, but if you want to look at the effective mass eigenstates, they behave as if neutrinos are coming from the right to the x-axis, and anti-neutrinos are coming from the left to the x-axis. Okay. This just allows us to look at this in a pictorial form and understand what's happening. Okay, we will look at these figures uh, again and again. Okay. Now, this place where you see that. Uh, these two eigenstates come very very close to each other. This kind of crossing, this crossing actually corresponds to what we call as MSW resonance. Okay. So exactly at this point where you see these two sort of black lines cross, is the point where delta times cosine two theta is equal to a. This is the time point at which the value of sine square two theta is equal to one, and therefore you get maximal flavor conditions. Okay. So Far away from this, mixing angle is very very small, so you don't really care about what happens to convergence. You only worry about what happens in in this region. Okay, apart from that, you don't really have to care. So our problem now has become slightly simplified. Okay, well, not very, but maybe slightly. 
what you think of is that I produce two kinds of neutrinos, let's say electron and muon neutrino, very, very far away, deep inside the core. They come out and I concentrate on the region in which they have this MSW resonance and I see what happens when they come out. A nice thing that happens is at very large densities, the value of mixing angle actually is 90 degrees, which means that sine square of 2 theta m is zero. And therefore, at very large densities, these uh, uh, eigenstates are actually simply flavor eigenstates. Okay? So in this diagram, you can think that what is produced at the end of these are electron and muon neutrinos. Okay? So the, the pink line can be electron neutrino and blue line can be muon neutrino. So as long as they are away from resonance, nothing happens to them. But at some point of time, they of course have to come out, pass, go on left. They have to come across the resonance. Inside the resonance, some of the electron neutrinos will convert to muon neutrinos and so on, and therefore they will change. Okay, And therefore we need to understand what happens inside uh, this particular resonance. Okay? So out of this, what will happen finally is this peak some fraction of this called PF will go along the, uh, the green line and the remaining fraction will go along the uh, pink line. Okay. Again, uh, 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 a nice uh, thing that simplifies matters is that if matter density is smooth, we know that PF is zero, which means that if matter density is smooth, my pink line, which are my electron neutral nodes, will come along this and after passing along uh, through the resonance will keep on going along the pink line. My muon neutrinos will start like a green line and after passing through resonance will keep on going along the green line. Okay? And that just makes our life simple. Okay? So as long as density is smooth, uh, uh, this is valid and that helps us actually calculate what is happening. Okay, so this was what was happening for two flavor mixing, which was a simplified case, okay. like this. Okay. But of course, we know that our case is three neutrino case, and that's what makes things even more fun. Okay. So what happens now? Instead of uh, two of these eigenstates crossing each other, three eigenstates cross each other. Okay. So you perhaps see this nice diagram. Okay, electron neutrinos produced at the far end, at very very deep inside the star. Uh, start coming out. Just one second. Uh, I just want to adjust certain things. Oops. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. So electron neutrinos come out uh, towards left to the vacuum. Uh, while coming, uh, they are the red line. They come across what you see is the H resonance. Okay. And then they come out like this. B and tau neutrino are at different levels, and they also come like this. But now, because it's a, a three by three neutrino math matrix, uh, these eigenvalues take these nice uh, smooth shapes. Okay? So sometimes this neutrino encounter what is called as the H resonance. H just means high resonance. It happens at high densities, and after some time, when they come to this density, okay, they undergo what's called as L resonance. Okay? So. So details are not needed to be known, except that these two resonances uh, happen at different densities. Okay. Now, I have two figures here. One I call as normal mass ordering, second inverted mass ordering. Okay. And the great stuff about uh, supernova neutrinos is that depending on the mass ordering, these figures change. Right? Just notice that these two diagrams are not the same. They're very, very different. Okay. Look at nu3 or the mass of m3. Nu3 is usually the heaviest mass eigenstate. If nu3 is heaviest in the normal ordering, then the figure looks like this. If nu3 is the lightest, then the figure looks like this. So one important thing you will notice now is that H resonance here is towards the towards very, very right. It means it is going to happen in neutrinos at high densities. For inverted mass ordering, this H resonance is towards left. And we know that left corresponds to uh, anti neutrinos. So this is going to happen in anti neutrinos. Okay. So this tells us 
that whether the resonance will happen in neutrinos or anti neutrinos for h will depend on the mass ordering okay and because resonances decide flavor conversions the mass ordering decides flavor conversions okay and therefore it's important to see what is the flavor conversions in different mass orderings so then if we identify how much it is we can identify the mass ordering okay so remember that uh, professor murthy also mentioned yesterday that finding out mass ordering of neutrinos is one of the most unresolved problem in the in the neutrino okay so this is uh, uh, again i want to keep this in front of your eyes for some time there is a high density resonance h a low density resonance n okay high density resonance h can be neutrinos if ordering is normal it will be anti neutrinos if the um, uh, ordering is inverted okay then there is a resonance called as l which always happens in neutrinos okay why this happens this you can do by uh, diagonalizing your matrix matrix finding out eigen values and uh, eigen functions but let's not do that yeah? just take this one what we will see are the consequences of this okay so this is again what i said uh, uh, just to repeat so l resonance uh, depends on the time square atmospheric and depends on the reactor mixing angle it happens at densities of about 1000 grams per cc or 10000 grams per cc which is in the mantle of the star it happens in neutrinos for normal ordering and it happens anti neutrinos for inverted ordering okay and has a l resonance which depends on the solar mass square difference it depends on the solar mixing angle and this takes place around densities of maybe 10 to 100 gas per cc so somewhere between uh, mantle and the envelope and this happens always in neutrinos okay so this resonance will affect oscillations of neutrinos and h resonance will affect oscillations of both neutrinos and anti neutrinos okay inside the sun only l resonance takes place okay and the reason is that The density. Then I na bali na. The density inside the sun is. Sorry for the glitch, sir. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So density inside the sun is not very large. Okay. So along this x-axis, you cannot go as far away as h for solar resonance. So inside the sun, uh, only resonance you see is the l resonance. So that is okay. In the case of supernova. uh we can go to really large density see inside the sun density can go to about 100 grams per cc so you can see h resonance but inside the sun you cannot see h resonance okay so supernova is the only place where you can actually observe h resonance yes okay? so that's one major reason to have a look at what happens in the supernova okay so what happens as a result of these resonances so what we expect to happen is that the fluxes of neutrinos will mix okay what does this mean let's say initially the flux of electron neutrinos is f0 mu e okay but finally when you see the final flux of neutrinos it will be a combination of initial electron neutrino flux and initial muon neutrino flux okay x here means either muon or tau doesn't really matter so it becomes a combination of these two and in fact uh, it expression is given like this sub p times initial electron neutrino flux plus 1 minus p times initial muon neutrino flux so this p is called as survival probability of electron neutrino because these many neutrinos survive the remaining uh, get converted similarly for uh, electron anti neutrinos okay uh, the expression is given like this where p bar is called as the survival probability of mu e bar okay and the remaining ones get converted to uh, muon neutrinos okay so these will be called as survival probabilities this survival probability is actually get averaged okay because of many reasons uh, one of which was discussed yesterday uh, we do not know where the neutrinos are actually produced okay as a result the length traveled by neutrinos inside the star is not very fixed 
as a result oscillation get average there are also many other reasons but what happens because of this is that the value of p and t bar are approximately constant with energies okay so things are now simple you have to just find out the value of p by looking at the final flux of ue this is one exception about which we will talk in tomorrow's class uh, when the shock wave passes the shock wave actually disturbs this okay uh, it means the oscillation do not get averaged and as a result we will get some no uh, nice results but then we'll talk about that yeah, about uh, tomorrow okay uh, for whatever we are doing today p and p bar are approximately constant energy okay now the value of p and p bar depends on the mass order so we saw right the the way neutrinos pass through resonances depends on mass order no normal or mass order is a different way inverted is a different way okay so therefore if we can uh, find the value of p and p bar they will help us identify the mass order okay so you would say fine the problem is not very simple all i have to do is find is measure the flux of ue flux of ue bar find out the value of p find out the value of p bar and i will know what are the what is happening at the resonances okay so that's it okay however that assumes that the fluxes have to be known accurately okay so you have to know the value of the primary fluxes no flux of uh, initial flux of ue bar initial flux of ux bar initial flux of uh, ue initial flux of ux have to be known the problem is that they are not known they are not known at all when i say at all i said they are not known to maybe almost a factor of 2 okay well not to maybe up to 50% the reason actually lies in astrophysics of you the supernova astrophysics is not very well known okay as a result we can only guess what's happening inside a supernova okay and therefore we do not know exactly what are the initial fluxes of uh, ue and u mu and because we do not know even if you observe this we can say basically nothing okay so let's take the example look at this okay so let's say red here is the initial ejector neutrino this uh, pink is the initial muon neutrino okay and uh, what we observe on the earth is this uh, violet curve now if we knew what is red curve and what is uh, pink curve we can say okay okay violet curve looks like maybe 50 50% so if must be 50% of ejector neutrino 50% so p is equal to 0.5 and we will be very happy however we don't know what is the red curve and what is the pink curve what we see is only this uh, violet curve okay and now you can imagine that we only look at a violet curve we can say nothing about what fraction was electron what fraction was muon okay. so therefore only observing the uh, violet curve here which is the which is the final curve mixing of electron and muon neutrinos or on the right hand side you will see uh, a blue curve is new uh, e bar uh, pink curve is again new x bar and this uh, cyan curve Uh, this faint blue curve is the mixed but you will not see the dark blue curve and the pink curve you will only see this curve which is the mixed curve okay and that basically means that we can you will know nothing so you cannot find out p and p and what this means is that whatever we learned till now perhaps seems to have gone to waste because it seems we will learn nothing okay however there is a solution which is going to come very soon okay i just want to want to tell you why it is very difficult to figure out things about about supernova okay so let me see if people have any questions at this point of time okay i don't want people to get lost because things are of course of course quite complicated yeah uh, okay a question should we study neutrinos is enough and we can know about anti neutrinos uh so actually we need to know properties of both neutrino and antineutrino especially inside a supernova because you see inside a supernova 
there are nuclei of all kinds okay and all these nuclei interact with both neutrinos and anti neutrinos differently okay as a result if we really want to understand supernova completely we need to know about interactions of neutrinos with nuclei and interactions of anti neutrinos with nuclei okay so it is important for us to know both of them okay second is of course a question of uh, of uh, philosophy and curiosity which is we have to know properties of all the particles to understand the world okay we saw yesterday that is possible that neutrino and anti neutrino have different properties and that could perhaps give rise to the matter antimatter asymmetry okay on the other hand we also saw that it's possible that neutrino and anti neutrino are actually the same thing okay in which case we should find that also okay so in order to be able to do that we should study both of them separately and look whether the properties are the same or they differ slightly okay so in, in that case it is this is important good question yes. okay so i will i will, I will go ahead. so now we will try to uh, understand uh, the passage of neutrinos from the mantle all the way to detector okay so let's see what are the issues in world so we come back to the familiar figure and uh, let us see what is what's happening here okay so uh, forget about core for the moment okay we are going to leave that for future inside the mantle envelope what did we see there are two resonances h and l okay when the resonances happen uh, due to the fluxes mix and we have probability of survival which are called as p and p bar now uh neutrinos come out of the envelope and exit the star okay. now when they exit the star okay it turns out that they exit the star at approximately mass eigen states okay so uh, the way we uh, we look at this is we say what comes out of the star are u1 u2 and u3 okay let me see if i can uh, right on this maybe i can in this case it might be nice uh, okay let me just try yeah so what comes out of the star are u1 u2 okay and u3 which are the three mass eigen states of neutrinos okay now mass eigen states are the same as energy eigen states I remember what we said earlier we said that if initial state is not energy eigen state then there are oscillations okay but if initial states are actually energy eigen states there are no oscillations they they things just propagate without oscillations okay so what this means is that if what comes out of of a star are mass eigen states they will propagate and will not oscillate so therefore this tells you that oops second yeah so it means that when going from coming from the supernova all the way to the earth when you to know travel many many kiloparsecs during this travel there are no oscillations okay uh, you cannot see okay fine in which case i will i will not rely on that and i will just tell you what happened okay okay fine okay so the the final result is the following is that uh, from the star the three mass eigen states which are u1 u2 and u3 which are fixed masses right m1 m2 and m3 okay. because they are fixed masses they are fixed energies and because they are fixed energies they don't oscillate okay. and therefore the neutrino flavors do not change between the supernova to the earth this is a very important concept and uh, sometimes it also comes as very surprising concept to people who even do this uh, uh, do supernova neutrino or even neutrino physics in fact this is true also in the sun okay uh, i don't remember if this was emphasized enough but to a very good approximation neutrinos 
inside the sun have already oscillated when they're inside the sun because the resonance happens inside the sun. Once the solar neutrinos come outside the sun, they do not oscillate all the way from the sun to the earth. Just like that, when they travel from supernova to the earth, neutrinos will not oscillate. Okay, so the oscillations are over. Okay. However, now what happens is sometimes these neutrinos have to enter the earth. Now, when they enter the earth, what would happen? So remember that inside the medium, the mass eigenstates change. When mass eigenstates change, then new one, new two, and new three, which came as mass eigenstates, are no longer mass eigenstates inside the matter. Which means inside the earth, they will start oscillating again. Okay, so it's quite a funny thing that's happening. Okay, neutrinos oscillate in the mantle and the envelope. They stop oscillating once they exit the supernova, come all the way to the earth without oscillating. But once they enter the earth, they start oscillating again. Now, this creates a very interesting situation for us who want to look at the, at the supernova. Suppose you have one detector here. Okay. Uh, so the neutrinos just come and are detected at, the, at this detector. What will happen? The detector will only see new one, new two, and new three. Okay. Uh, and they will not have oscillated. But detector on the other side of the earth will, will see oscillations in those neutrinos, even in new one, new two, and new three. Okay, so this is a great thing because it means that multiple detectors help us. One detector will not see these oscillations. The second detector will see the oscillations. Okay, and that helps us figure out if oscillations actually happen or not. Okay, so this is what happens. So let's say the so supernova is here somewhere at the top. So they are coming here uh, like mass eigenstates. Okay, so D here, uh, it's called D1. D1 is the detector where neutrinos come as mass eigenstates and you see what happens to them. Okay. On the other hand, if D2 is the detector at the other end of the earth, the neutrinos come down like this. As soon as they enter matter, they start oscillating. They pass through this mantle. Maybe they pass through other layers of earth. They may pass through core, <coughs> through inner core. And by the time they come to D, D2, they will have oscillated more. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, is this not true only if you have adiabatic approximations? What if there are sudden transitions? Okay, so in fact, the transitions that happen at the surface of the earth when they enter the planetary density are quite sudden. Okay, and that is the reason that at this point of time you start, uh, start oscillating. Okay, uh, was that a question, Murthy, or did you have to ask me about something else? I was asking about the supernova. When you go from the core to the surface, uh -huh. uh, you are saying that they exit as pure states, pure yes. mass eigenstates. Yeah, that's true. That is assuming that there is an adiabatic transition because they are produced in such pure mass uh, eigenstates. No, no, this is not needed. Yeah. So I, 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 I tell you slightly technical reason for this. Of course, I, I mentioned that uh, shock wave changes those things. However, yeah. the reason that uh, neutrinos come out as mass eigenstates okay, right. is because uh, they oscillate so rapidly inside oh. in this large density media okay. that information about their phase is lost. Okay. okay. So they lose coherence in the technical language and yeah. therefore they come out as mass eigenstates. Okay. So okay. even if it is not adiabatic, they will always come out as mass eigenstates. Okay. Nice. That's the, okay. Thanks. Okay. The values of P and P bar will depend on whether they came out, the transition was adiabatic or not. Okay. But the fact that they are mass eigenstates is always valid. Okay. So, yeah, so we are looking at the, at what happened inside the Earth. Okay. So what's happening now is the neutrinos start oscillating again when they enter the Earth. Okay. So therefore, detector D will not see oscillations detector this D2 will see oscillations. So what it will see is that the value of P and P bar is no longer a constant. Okay. In fact, it looks like an oscillating energy dependence. So the value of P, for example, uh, will be some P dot, which is the earlier probability. But because it goes through Earth, 
it gives this extra term. Don't look at this term. Just look at this e. Okay, this term has energy dependence. Okay, so it goes as sine square of delta m square a over e. Okay, so which means that as energy changes, the probability goes up and down. Okay, what this means is that when you look at the, the supernova neutrons at the Earth. You will not see this uh, violet curve on the left hand side, which is what we saw earlier, uh, which is what detector one will see, but you will see this black curve. Okay. And now you see something, uh, no, perhaps many of you would have guessed it already. The fact that you see this oscillating curve makes it very easy to identify oscillations. Right? See, earlier, when I had only showed you the violet curve, you cannot say whether this came from oscillations or whether everything here was electron neutrino or muon neutrino or anything of that sort. But if you see oscillations like this, you can be very, very sure that this is not simply electron neutrino, it's a mixing of electron neutrino and muon neutrino. Okay, so therefore, uh, it is possible that the mixed spectra can be identified on the earth if we can see these so-called as earth matter effects. Okay. So in neutrinos, the effects look like this on the left hand side. On anti-neutrinos, effects look like this on the right hand side. Okay. So now what this means is that the earth matter effects have allowed us to identify that something happened inside a supernova in which flavors got converted. And that's a very good thing to know. I have said sometimes can be identified. Why did I say sometimes? Uh, two reasons. One is, of course, if it so happens that neutrinos don't have to pass through Earth, the detector happens to be facing the supernova. Okay, detector uh, supernova is on top, and detector just sees the neutrino directly. It will not see oscillations. If you are in this unfortunate situation where all our detectors can see the supernova in the sky, they will not see oscillations. Okay. Uh, so one condition is that at least one detector uh, should see the supernova through the Earth. Okay. So which means that for at least one detector, neutrino should come from the bottom. Okay. That is very, very important. This is the reason why for looking at supernova, you should have many detectors which are distributed all the way around the earth. Okay, so, and therefore, you cannot give one job to one detector. It's not like LHC, where LHC, Large Hadron Collider, well, you build a very big machine, it will solve all the problems. It will not happen in the case of supernova. Even if you build just one very big detector, it will not help. You need at least a few detectors which are all around the earth, and we will see tomorrow that indeed uh, we, we do have. Okay, yeah, a very interesting question has come. Are oscillations different for muon and tau from which we can distinguish between them? So it so turns out that inside a supernova, mu and tau neutrinos behave almost exactly identically. Okay, within errors, we cannot distinguish between them. Okay, it's in some sense an unfortunate situation because we cannot figure out what happens in mu and tau. In one sense, it is fortunate because we know that the fluxes of muon and tau neutrinos are identical. Okay? And we know that fluxes of muon and tau antineutrinos are also identical. So it makes life simple to, uh, to calculate and check against what we observe. But indeed, this is a very important point. Inside the supernova, uh, muon and tau neutrinos behave exactly identically, and therefore we cannot distinguish them. Yeah, good question. I hope such questions keep on coming, okay? Because uh, things are interesting. By this time, you must have got this feeling, right? So every new thing that we try to look for, we come across new physics ideas, right? We initially had uh, uh, what happens inside mantle, then we suddenly uh, got these emergency resonances. Then at some point of time, we said, okay, we're traveling in vacuum. Oh, nothing happens, okay? Wonderful, something I had not seen before. Then I say, okay, when I enter the Earth, I start oscillating again. So all this newer and newer physics is, is coming when you study a simple question, right? What are you trying to solve? 
we are trying to just try to see one neutrino or the set of neutrinos start from the center of the star come to earth in a straight line okay no bending nothing gets and all of the physics that we are learning today is what's happening to these set of neutrinos as as they come okay so what you have seen so far is what happens when neutrinos start from the bent end and come all the way to the earth and go in the detector Now we go to the slightly more complicated part, which is what happens inside the core of the supernova, and we'll see that uh, even stranger things, unimagined things, start happening. Uh, this is something that, by the way, has happened in just last ten to fifteen years. Okay, so this is in fact the no, history of neutrinos is being written right now because uh, we have understood or trying to understand what happens inside a supernova only in last. 10 to 15 years so it's it's really really quite new stuff and that's the reason that you will not see it in it in any textbooks you will perhaps not even see it in many books there could be just maybe handful of books which which mention this but most of what we are discussing now is right now only in in papers okay? uh, so when we go to last section at many places i have referred to certain papers and you could go and, and look at them if you want okay but this is really really new stuff Whose answers are not even known to the scientists who work in them. So, for those of you who you who become uh, maybe enthusiastic to uh, learn about supernova, can actually you know contribute something very very original by studying what happens in detail. Okay, so what I'm giving to you is just a, a glimpse of what's happening. Okay. Uh, uh, any questions, or uh, should I go ahead? So I am now going to look at what's happening in the supernova. Okay, so let me see this question. Vacuum is not completely vacuum for neutrinos to not oscillate. Is there something else? Yeah. So remember what we saw is that oscillations of neutrinos mainly happen in the MHW resonance region or regions nearby that. Okay. So as long as we are far away from those regions. Our neutrinos will not oscillate. Okay, so I will just go back to our my my favorite uh, picture, which was uh, somewhere here, and I will tell this again because this is really really important. Okay, see so near MSW resonances, okay, which are these H and L, okay, where eigenstates come very close together, you will see that uh, see flavor eigenstates are the straight lines, okay, mass eigenstates are uh, Curved lines or colored lines. Okay, so if you are away from these resonances, you see that mass eigenstates are the same as flavor eigenstates. Okay, and when that happens, it basically means that sine square two theta i means zero, and there will not be any oscillations. So whenever you are far away from a resonance, you will not oscillate. You will only oscillate near a resonance. Okay, so now look at this u e which is coming. Uh, at zero densities, which means along y-axis, the mass and flavor eigenstates are almost identical. So neutrinos, therefore, will not oscillate in this case because you are very far away from resonance. Here, uh, nu and tau, these will oscillate, of course, because uh, they you see they are they are not the same as, uh, as mass eigenstates. Okay, so uh, as long as second. Second thing is, as long as you are uh, energy eigenstate or mass eigenstate, you will not oscillate. Okay. So for us, we are saved by the fact that what exits from a star are actually mass eigenstates. Okay, the ones that I tried to show here. So what exits from the star are mass eigenstates. Therefore, things will not oscillate. They will not oscillate in vacuum uh, because they are uh, energy eigenstates. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess that was the question. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's not completely vacuum, as long as what is coming out are eigenstates in this medium, that's perfectly okay. Okay, so it's very small changes will not matter. Okay. Okay, so now let's see what happens inside the core. Now inside the core. Situation which is very very strange, and in fact, it has a situation which occurs nowhere else. Okay, nowhere else in the universe 
is the situation. What is the situation? The situation here is that the densities are extremely large. Like the density of matter, as we saw, can be almost nuclear density, which is 10 power 14, 10 power 15 grams per cc. What this means is that the densities of neutrinos themselves can become as large as 10 to the power 30 or 10 to the power 35 neutrinos per centimeter cube. Okay, just imagine uh, the, the, in a centimeter cube of space, you have 10 to the power 35 neutrinos, really, really densely packed neutrinos. Okay. Now, what happens at such large densities is that interactions between neutrino and other neutrinos become very, very significant. So remember, this was a question which perhaps came in, uh, in uh, on the first or second day. Somebody asked, what about interactions of neutrinos with themselves? Okay, and the answer given was, yes, uh, they do interact, but they interact only weakly. And when things interact only weakly, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the weak interactions are so weak that everything else overwhelms that. But now, you of course have only weak interactions, but the number is so large, if you add those tiny, tiny, tiny contributions, they actually become huge. And they become so huge now that they overwhelm whatever was happening with MSW oscillations. Okay. So what happens is that at these large densities, the neutrino, neutrino interactions become very, very significant. Okay. So remember the density of neutrinos is 10 power 30, 35. And when two things interact, it means that the product of their concentrations uh, gives you rate of reaction like you did in chemistry. So that product now becomes 10 power 70, really, really, very, very large numbers. So what happens is earlier, okay, the mixing of neutrinos depended on electron density, right? So remember we had A, that factor A depended on density of electrons, which caused matter effects. But now the mixing of neutrinos depends on neutrino flavors, not only electrons, also neutrinos. Okay, so earlier we had only electrons and there are no muons and there are no taus inside, uh, uh, inside the star because uh, they are not produced. But for neutrinos, we have neutrinos of all types. We have electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, tau neutrinos. We have electron antineutrinos, muon antineutrinos and tau antineutrinos. So we have all six flavors and the mixing now depends on all those six flavors. Okay, so already you can imagine the situation is becoming complicated because it's not just electron density, but also neutrino density. Okay. So earlier, when neutrinos traveled, electrons in the, yeah, in the supernova acted as a background. Okay, so earlier, the neutrino oscillations depended on the background of electrons. Now, neutrino flavors depend on background of neutrinos. Okay, so neutrino mixing depends on neutrino flavor background. Okay. But we know that neutrino flavors depend on neutrino mixing because uh, neutrino mixing is what causes flavors of different flavor, different neutrinos. So you see, this is complicated now. And this is exactly what is called as a nonlinear problem. Okay, so earlier what happened? Okay, I I uh, increase, let's say the electron density became twice, the value of my matter potential became twice. So a value of a became twice, and I could solve the problem. Not a problem. Now what happens is my neutrino flavors themselves depend on background neutrinos. Background neutrinos depend on neutrino flavors. And that what makes the problem very, very hard. Okay. So in fact, this problem was has been with us for last maybe more than 15 years. And we do not have a complete solution to this. Okay. Everybody, including myself, have been trying very hard to solve the problem. And we have solved the problem and got some interesting results, which, which I will tell you. But the whole problem is not yet solved. And no, in fact, it is still open. Okay. So what happened inside the core is actually very, very hard. Uh, I will show you some equations on this slide just to sort of scare you to, to, to tell you that things are, are complicated. Okay. So 
what actually happens is that a neutrino uh, which is given by this which is a neutrino which is given by q uh, sorry given by p it has a momentum p and his emit is traveling in this direction at every point it encounters neutrinos of some other momentum called as q and they interact and when they interact uh, uh, the neutrino propagation gets affected okay and in fact if you see from this uh, slightly complicated equation that you see on top what depends is a uh, reasonably basic situation okay in simple terms okay what it means is that equation of motion of neutrinos can be written in this form okay rho is a density matrix of neutrinos uh, i do not know if people are familiar with the density matrix formulation of quantum mechanics but uh, in quantum mechanics you can just like you write schrodinger's equation you can write equation of motion depending on the density density matrix okay not not density and this density matrix this is the commutator of hamiltonian and density matrix okay and this commutator tells you how a system evolves in quantum mechanics now turns out here is that hamiltonian itself depends on the density and that is what makes this problem non linear okay again if you are, if you don't have background for this you don't need to understand this all that you need to uh, to know is that the problem is non linear and therefore quite difficult okay. non linear problems end up giving you very very new physical phenomena okay so just like no you uh, we said that neutrino oscillation is a new physical phenomena we also saw that uh, msw resonances happen that's a new physical phenomena because something it was not really expected similarly the non linear nature of this gives rise to other new phenomena okay so i'll just tell you some of the phenomena and uh, i'll show you what they look like so these phenomena are called as collective effects okay because these oscillations of neutrinos happen collectively or together it is not just one neutrino traveling by itself and trying to oscillate but all the neutrinos now oscillate together with each other okay how neutrino one oscillates depends on how neutrino number two oscillates it depends on how neutrino number three oscillates it depends on how neutrino number uh, no 1023 oscillates okay so uh, these are called as collective effects because because of this oscillations happen of many neutrinos but at the same time so what happens is that at very very high densities all the neutrinos oscillate with the same frequency now remember earlier when we looked at uh, neutrino oscillations neutrino oscillations depended on the energy right so even even when i showed you let's say the nearest one this one yeah look at this uh, probability right the dependence was sin square of some delta square length or energy so neutrinos with different energies would have different oscillations okay but now what happens in the case in the core is that all of them oscillate together and oscillate with exactly the same frequency okay it's a new phenomenon that was discovered maybe only about Uh, 10 or uh, 20 years ago then when the density reduces slowly another interesting things happen okay what happens are called as bipolar oscillations so don't don't go to those words but what it means is that when a new e becomes new mu at the same time a new e bar should also become a new mu bar again a very very new phenomenon and only happens because neutrinos interact with each other with a very large extent because you are in a, in a large density medium right so this was discovered only about 15 years ago okay in fact uh, uh, no, very few people in the world have been working with this then what happens is as they come out even more what neutrinos do is they interchange their spectra completely in certain energy regions okay and this was discovered only about 10 or 12 years ago Okay, and I, I was I was involved in discovering this. I tell you what this means. Okay, I'll show you a figure. It's, it's quite uh, quite fun to know what happens. Okay, so look at this neutrino curve figures. Okay, so red curve is uh, neutrinos, electron neutrinos, 
and blue curve is beyond neutrinos. Okay, so what happens is when the neutrino fluxes come on the Earth in this gray region. I hope you can see the gray region. Okay, outside the gray region, nothing happens. Okay, electron neutrinos are red, beyond are blue. They was like just like they are. Inside the gray region, they swap. So inside the gray region, all the electron neutrinos become beyond neutrinos. Okay, so even this red neutrinos that were there have now become blue. All the muon neutrinos become electron neutrinos. So this muon neutrinos here, which were like this, have now become red. So you see the shape of this curve has become very strange, right? It goes up like this, comes down here, has a sort of camel hump, and then comes down here. Okay. So the result of this actually means that it converts your spectrum to very very strange forms. These new forms are called as spectral splits, okay. And the multiple spectral splits is one of the things that, uh, at some point of time, we discovered. Depending on different mass ordering, so NH means normal mass ordering. In normal mass ordering, uh, the spectra are switched in this gray energy region here, okay, in the uh, high energy region. For inverted mass ordering, they are uh, swapped in this. Uh, Intermediate energy. Okay. Similarly, for anti neutrinos, the hierarchy ordering is normal. They are swapped in this gray energy region, uh, high energies, and for inverted ordering, they are swapped here. Okay. So, what this means is that depending on your ordering, you are swapped in different regions, which makes the shape of your final spectrum look very different. Now, this is very important, right? Now remember, uh, if we simply see a nice curve, uh, which just goes up and comes down like this, we can't see whether things have been uh, mixed or not. But if you see you know, the strange mixing strange spectra like this, you actually know that you have seen the effect of collective oscillations. Okay. On the Earth, you cannot do any experiment that can show you the effect of neutrino neutrino interactions because the effects are extremely small. But when you see supernova neutrinos, you can see actually effects of this neutral neutral interaction. So it's very, very, very important that the only way that you can ever observe these interactions is if you see neutrinos from a supernova. Okay. So it's it's a really, really important part that I would like you to appreciate. I mean, these are some of the reasons why we are spending one whole week on just learning about what happens in supernova neutrinos, right? So, uh, yeah, so this part is there for me. Very recently, uh, recently, I mean, even the last five years, okay, they have been even more developments, okay? So I'll try to tell you what, what they are. So let's see what we had earlier. See, earlier, we saw that there are the H and L resonances which happen inside the star. And they would start happening around radius of about 1,000 kilometers. Okay, that is where density would become about 1,000, 10,000 gas per okay. Then the collective transformations that I showed you in the last two slides actually start happening much deeper in the core. Okay, they start happening when the radius is about 100 kilometers, so deeper inside the star. What was discovered about five years ago is that some special kind of collective transformations, which are called as fast collective transformations, start happening as deep as 10 kilometers. So very, very deep inside the core, already due to those start oscillating. Okay? And this is possible if there are certain symmetries which are broken. So if star is not completely spherically symmetric, for example, these ones, okay, we now know that they happen, okay, but they are still being investigated. People do not have a good idea of exactly what happens. We know only, only certain things. But we know that once we understand this, this is going to be very, very significant. And why is it significant? Because, see, if flavor changes happen deep inside the core, electron neutrinos become muon neutrinos. Electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos have different cross sections. As a result, they will push the shock wave with different strengths. 
So if your electrodes and muon neutrinos are going to change your change flavor deep inside, much behind the shock wave, you are going to affect affect the explosion of the star. Okay, and that's the reason why this is one of the unsolved problems, which is very great significance, because now our understanding of supernova explosions might change a bit because how much energy neutrinos give to the shock wave depends on what is their flavor. Okay, and what collective oscillations tell you is that deep inside the star at 10 kilometers from the center, so deep inside the core, actually neutrino flavors can change. Okay, so all of these things are, are hard to digest uh, and full of surprises. Even for me, every time I say this, because I did not know this five years ago. Okay, so it's only last five years that we have figured out that these things might happen. Okay, so already I have told you about many, many new phenomena. So let's go back and try to understand the red picture because that is what is more important. Okay, so this is the familiar picture that I will take to here again. And now uh, try to explain to you what happens. Okay, just have a look at this till I perhaps have a, a sip of water. Okay, so what's happening? Deep inside the supernova core earlier, neutrinos were trapped. Okay, so before I go, let me uh, comment on this comment. Yes, an ideal supernova detector should measure neutrinos, anti neutrinos as a function of energy and time. Yeah, with measuring it. That's correct. So, in fact, uh, tomorrow's lecture is going to be based on that. What will you observe? Yes. Okay. But remember, uh, so this is a question. I, I'll ask the question again. Very good question. Isn't it obvious that if neutrino changes its flavors, so should its antiparticle to obey the laws of conservation? Okay, that is correct. However, remember what we are doing is something more fundamental. We are not trying to solve a question in a textbook. Okay. Who tells us law of conservation? We devise law of conservation. Okay. We took many observations and all the observations told us that, okay, the, 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 some laws of conservation are allowed. Let's say momentum is conserved, energy is conserved, maybe the electron number is conserved. Okay. But we don't know. We observe and we make the laws. And when you start working at, at science at the forefront, you're always trying to check all your laws. And in fact, you try to break the laws. You try to find out extreme situations where these laws can be broken. So remember, Newton gave us laws of motion, right? Now, we could be satisfied with them because everything that we see, they are obeyed, and therefore we see Newton's laws are fine. But Einstein tried to look at what happens to these laws in extreme situations. It could be extreme situation, very, very high velocities. And then, you no, know, well, not only him, but people who develop relativity found out that those laws are broken in extreme situations. What physicists as a researchers do is they look at the extreme situations. Now what we are doing, we are to look at extreme situations like very, very high density inside a core or extreme situations where the neutrino neutrino interactions become important. And we try to test our laws to see if they are broken. Because if they are broken, it means we have discovered new laws. Right? When Einstein discovered relativity, what did he do? He discovered new laws of motion, right? relativistic laws of motion. Similarly here, if we discover something which is not according to what we saw earlier, it means that we have discovered new laws of physics. And no, as, as a physicist, a researcher, your aim is to discover something new. No? Uh, you, you might also remember discovery of neutrinos, right? They were discovered because of beta decays. In beta decays, they saw that somehow you don't see energy being conserved, right? And that's the reason you saw that neutrinos were discovered. Okay, so anytime that you want to figure out why certain laws of conservation are broken, it tells you something new about physics. Okay? And that's the reason that we try to test laws of conservation. Right? So a very good question. And the answer is yes, 
we should not be satisfied at saying, oh, there is a law of conservation that I read in my textbook. No, you are the one as a researcher that you should find out where this law does not hold and then you will discover new physics, right? That's, that's the fun. Okay. Hey, yeah, Amol, you got muted. Uh, am I muted? Because Amol, I don't no, sir. No, sir. You are not muted. Uh, not muted. Okay. So, uh, Murthy, uh, maybe check your, check your microphone. Maybe. Uh... No, I couldn't hear a few minutes. Okay. Now it's all right. Okay. Okay, good. So now let's summarize what, what we understood. Okay. So deep inside the supernova core, neutrinos are trapped. Okay. After the collapse happens, neutrinos of different flavors are emitted. Now these flavors will now pass through mantle and envelope. Okay. Now, firstly, even inside the core, first they will undergo these fast uh, collective effects, which are nonlinear effects because of uh, neutrino neutrino interactions. Okay, so they start doing that. And maybe they'll also affect the propagation of shock wave. They come out in the mantle or envelope and around uh, 1000 kilometers or a few thousand kilometers, they will undergo H and L resonances. As a result, uh, there will be some flavor conversions. Okay. After that, they will come out of the star, they will travel in vacuum, and there will be no oscillations till they reach the Earth. Once they pass through the earth, there will be further flavor oscillations. Okay. So this is the overall picture of what happens to neutrino oscillations as they, uh, as they pass, uh, start from inception all the way to detection. Okay. So this principle is what will allow us to exploit our observations into learning something new. So as usual, in this uh, last slide, I will uh, give you questions for thinking. Okay? So question number one is what are the observable signatures of all these intricate oscillation physics? Okay, you would say, you told us these all intricate things, MSW flavor oscillation, neutral neutral interactions, non-linear, all those mixture of things happen. But what will we be able to observe? Things cannot stay only on paper. On paper, you see oscillations and you calculate something. No, that's not useful, right? Because we are going to try to understand nature and nature of particles, properties of particles. So we should first detect the particles and try to see what which among these things can we actually see. Okay. Okay. And lecture of tomorrow will be exactly around this. Okay. What are the observable uh, signatures of all these oscillations? So I will also talk about this. And the concluding talk of Professor Kate Schulberg will also be, be based around this. Okay. And one of the major things that I will talk about tomorrow is can neutrinos tell us what is happening inside the star? Okay. So remember that uh, when you see the supernova exploding, if you look at a supernova in the sky, you will only see once it explodes. Inside a supernova, lots of strange things are happening. Okay, which we cannot see. We only see the supernova once it explodes and gives a lot of light. So, can we tell what is happening before that inside the star? Okay. And the answer to this is going to be yes. And tomorrow I will tell you how is it that we can see with you know, inside the star. And that is going to be the uh, yeah, well, one of the really exciting parts of what is going to happen. Okay, so this is where uh, I'm going to stop my, uh, my lecture of today. Uh, I'll, I see, yeah, so we can of course take questions. There are still, I guess, uh, five more minutes, but those are entirely to the questions. Uh, I think uh, I, I will not uh, say anything. So I see a question. Okay, what is the question? Uh, the phenomenon of gravitational lenses happens, okay, for light if they move very near to massive stars. That is correct. Yeah. Is there any similar phenomenon in the case of uh, neutrons? Well, I guess you say you want to say neutrinos. And the answer is in principle yes. Okay. So just like light bends near massive stars, neutrinos will also bend near massive stars. 
So in principle, yes, it is indeed possible that you can see some kind of uh, gravitational lensing uh, for neutrinos if it happens. Uh, however, uh, looks like it will be very difficult to have a concrete observations okay, because you have to know, for example, it's possible for this to happen if let's say there's a supernova which happens exactly behind our sun. So maybe we observe that. Yeah, or maybe a, a supernova happens exactly behind the center of our galaxy and then we might be able to able to observe that. Yeah, so uh, uh, it's possible. But let's say people haven't really worked on this. So if you're interested, and you could you could try to see if we can do something. Okay. Uh, could we explain the correlation between adiabatic approximation and oscillations that you mentioned? So I will I will just yeah I try to explain. Okay. So since the word adiabatic came, I will tell you I, I tried to avoid the word today, but I will uh, since the question came up, I'll tell you what is adiabatic. So uh, you notice here, I said uh, that if the matter density is smooth, PF is zero, okay? If PF is zero, that is called as adiabatic, okay? So adiabatic approximation means that uh, inside a resonance, the eigenstate, which was, uh, let's say, nu2, which is coming from top, the pink eigenstate remains pink. This is called as adiabatic approximation. And normally inside a supernova, if the uh, matter density varies smoothly, then all the peak will always go to peak. That is called as adiabatic approximation. Okay. Now, suppose the matter density does not change smoothly. It changes suddenly. What will happen is that electron neutrinos, which were coming as this U2 coming from top, partly will go along blue, sorry, partly will go along pink, and partly we go along uh, along uh, this green curve, okay? which means that uh, partly uh, they will go as the higher mass eigenstate and partly as lower mass eigenstate. Okay? So when adiabaticity is broken, this is, uh, this is what happens. Okay? So if I go to this plot, for example, this is easy to see. So you see electron neutrinos red coming from top. Okay? If uh, they are passing through H resonance, at the same point of time, shock wave also passes through H resonance. What will happen is the electron neutrinos that are coming along this red line, some of them will go along red line as nu3, and some of them will go along blue line as nu2. Okay, so once a uh, shock wave comes, then electron neutrinos, some of them will become nu3, and some of them will become nu2. This will have effects in what we see inside the star. All of this is intimately connected with the final question that we had, which is how can we see inside the star with neutrinos, okay? So in fact, this concept of adiabaticity, which I had left for tomorrow, but it was good that we discussed it today, is important because exactly this adiabaticity will allow neutrinos to tell us what is happening inside the star. Okay? So yeah, so uh, yeah, good question and also good, uh, uh, good motivation for tomorrow's lecture. Okay, I think that is uh, probably uh, no more questions looks like. Okay, so in that case, uh, I'll stop for today and uh, we will see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this informative session. It was a privilege to have you with us. Tomorrow's lecture session link will be sent to your email IDs. Looking forward to see you all again. Thank you, one and all. Thank you.